Wow. <laughs> okay, there we go. Finally got it. Hello. Can you hear me? I feel like my clock is wrong. <laughs> Thank you so much, Helen. <laughs> Tease. That's, that's very kind of you to say that. It's lovely. <laughs> Hello. Can you all hear me? Greetings to all of you. Hello, Yusuf. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> oh, Paradox Junkie, you are too kind. Far, far too kind. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Oh, I'm so glad you can hear me. Okay, that's excellent. Oh, brilliant. How is everybody doing today? How are you? Hello, Coscuro Drift. Oh, I'm so glad. Oh, brilliant. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Oh, you know what? I'm actually quite thrilled because this evening I was expecting it to be boiling hot and it's actually not hot at all. I, I, I think that this is actually a doable situation. So yes, yes, I'm feeling a lot better since the major heat wave has left, at least physically. Psychologically, I think it's been quite tormenting for the entire British population. Everybody is quite doomeristic about everything that has taken place. And I think all of a sudden, the realities of an increasingly hot climate are starting to be taken note by many who otherwise would have just dismissed it as something that will only affect the world in the next century or so. So it's um, it's very interesting to see the sort of panic <laughs> that is ensuing. But yes. Oh, yes. Art by Leah. If that is your artwork, you are incredibly talented, by the way. Yes, the heat wave, I think it is going to be returning. Most definitely. I think this week, at least ne next weekend, it should be back at about 30 degrees, apparently, or higher. So we shall see. Yes, you said. <laughs> yes, we have all been tormented. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Yes, yes. But yes, yes, because of that, I have been unable to concentrate. So my mind has been elsewhere, regrettably. Um, <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, that's that. that I. <laughs> Wait, I'm going to try something that I haven't done before. Yes, I can. Oh, there we go. Look at that. I can broadcast your. <laughs> So Patio says, I almost thought the thumbnail said veganism is a mental disorder. <laughs> you know, considering my views on veganism, um, I have quite strong views on veganism, mind you. So I, I'll be very interested to sort of put it to you and to have your input and your thoughts and opinions, particularly from vegans or those who have considered the vegan lifestyle and diet. So it would be very interesting. But yes, it was. <laughs> and hello to my fabulous moderators, Count2123 and Zahara. Yes, if... If you, I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I know I keep saying this and it, it sounds like an excuse, but it isn't. Basically with YouTube, in the UK, we don't get paid by YouTube, like the American YouTube, which I assume is highly efficient. We get paid by YouTube, which is based in Northern Ireland. So because of that, I think that the Irish are a bit more lax about when they pay us. So I haven't been paid yet by YouTube. So I do apologize if your PayPal payments have not come through to you yet, but they should be. We're theoretically meant to be paid on the 21st, but alas, that has um, not as of yet happened. <laughs> so I do apologize if you haven't received your payments yet, but I hope you do very, very soon. Um, so it's lovely to see you and Zahara, you, I actually, I made a video all about my summer depressive state and uh, foreboding internal monologues that hit me very hard during the summer and my thumbnail literally says summertime sadness. <laughs> so you, you read my mind, so yes, um, <laughs> yes. But 
just before we get in, this sounds like a video, just before we get into everything, I have a little announcement. Um, don't get too excited. It's not that exci exciting. Um, not like I'm pregnant or anything. Uh, God forbid. But yes, yes. Um, I'll just go to that screen now. So this is this is my little announcement. Basically, I because I couldn't concentrate in the heat on anything, um, I decided to get my shit together. And that meant that I've decided to start this new weekly series that I'm going to be doing. Carrie O'Neill, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll broadcast that. I love the Irish, okay? The Irish, the Irish bought us Enya, and because of that, I, I can't say anything bad about the Irish. I love the Irish. Um, I absolutely love them. I mean, Liam Neeson, come on, come on. I mean, you, you know how I feel about Liam. <laughs> so <laughs> I've got nothing bad to say about the Irish. I actually, the only place that I've actually traveled to outside of the UK is Ireland and also to Northern Ireland in the UK. But in terms of like actually going traveling, um, you know, that's, that's where I've gone and I've loved it. So uh, yes, I've got nothing bad to say. But anyway, back to the announcement. Because I couldn't concentrate in the heat, I decided to get my shit together. And that meant that I decided to start this little series that I'm going to be doing called Kids Clips. Um, now it's not what it's, um, yes, Taloga, Enya is Irish, okay? She, I know too much about Enya, it's actually quite bad. <laughs> But anyway, um, these kids clips are basically going to be 10 to 15 minute videos. I've recorded the first three of them, which will be uploaded to my Patreon, all three every Friday. I'm doing three a week. And if you want to sign up to my Patreon, then this is a very good opportunity because I'll be putting three up every Friday evening in the UK time. And... I have three tiers on Patreon. So with the first tier, you'll get one video. If you in the second tier, you'll get two videos. And the third, you'll get three videos. If not, no worries at all. You do not, this is no pressure. I know the world is in uh, disarray with inflation and everything. So, you know, put your money where you need to put your money. So no worries if you can't, because you'll just have to have this delayed sense of gratification of seeing me talking about things that I don't necessarily want to dedicate an entire long form researched video to, but have thoughts and opinions about. And I will then upload the, these three videos every week, the week, um, let me, I'm sorry. So on Friday, I'll have these three uploaded onto Patreon. Depending on what tier you're on will depend how many you get. Then the weekend will pass. On Sundays, I'll live stream. Then on the Monday, I'll upload the first one. On the Wednesday, I'll upload the second one. And on Friday, I'll upload the third one. This is not going to affect at all the usual videos that I do. I still am going to do the long form research um, stuff. Don't worry. I've actually just finished editing my one that I was meant to have uploaded this Tuesday. My apologies for the delay. That will be uploaded either tomorrow, depending on how soon I get a copyright issue sorted out, or on Tuesday. And then I also have another one that I've already recorded today. And that will, well, I need to now edit that one. So that one should be out the following week. But Basically, this is just um, something for to to keep you entertained and to also keep the uh, the algorithm, I guess, friendly. I don't really know about this mythological sort of anthropomorphized algorithm. Um, I, I don't really care too much about it, but um, it it does help the channel. So um, yes, and I also have because I tend to have lots of thoughts about things that I read in the news. But I don't exactly see the point in dedicating a whole video to it. And I don't necessarily care so much that I feel like dedicating a whole video to it. So yes. So this is all something for your... Hello, Jayman. Hello. Um... <laughs> 
but the Lord's need complimented me. Oh, I'm so touched. <laughs> wow. Take note. Thank you so much, Lord's need. Um, so yes, this is just something that you can sort of peruse at your leisure. Uh, just sort of, yeah, yeah. So that's that's just my announcement for you. So I will be back on Patreon this Friday. Um, yeah, I really neglected my patron. Um, <laughs> my sincere apologies and thank you so much to my patrons for your incredible patience. Um, but yes, I feel that this is far more manageable and something that is far more interesting for, uh, well, for me to record and for you to hopefully listen to because I think my mirror is getting a bit tired of me just talking my opinions to it after I've sort of watched the news or something like that. So yes, I hope you enjoy it. And I will also uh, just be putting out like a poll about feedback about it, sort of about some of the topics. I'll also be covering a f some more, I guess, political things in these. Um, so yes, yes, feel, feel free to give me as much feedback, criticism, critique, and all of that as you would like. And yes, yes, so. I hope that's that's something that everybody likes but yeah yes um and also yeah i'm just getting so much admin out of the way look at this this is this is what happens when there's no heat i suddenly just come out of my shell it's great um just in case people don't realize because i know i haven't necessarily made this very clear but timestamps are available for all my live streams within the 24 hours after the stream has ended so do feel free to like not watch this live or to just pop in and out or whatever or to like watch this in the next few days or whenever at your leisure at your convenience because i will have timestamps uh available so that will all be there and i also go through all of the comments and then um i put like some of those that tickle me and that I find interesting. So do comment away in the comment section and yes. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's everything. Oh yes. And these are also the songs I've been listening to. You can sense my mood um, based on the music I've been listening to. I took a lot of recommendations. I think it was Youssef who said to me, who um, said uh, that I should listen to The Cure. Um, and I mean, I guess sort of like in passing, I've listened to The Cure, but not necessarily religiously because you're sort of either a Smiths fan, the Smiths fan or with The Cure. And so I was a bit torn, but I, I took your advice, Yusef, and I went for it. Um, and yes, Prayers for Rain has, I've just been listening to that on repeat, on repeat. And yes, Helmet, I love Helmet. I, I oh. I do. I love Helmet. If you like Helmet, sort of quite uh, heavy rock, um, you'll also love Black Midi, who are sort of the 21st century equivalent of Helmet. And I love Black Midi. And so Helmet was just this perfect little addition. And then somebody also recommended me English Teacher, who are this new emerging indie band. And I feel like I'm going to like English teacher, but I think that it is going to be, it's going to, I think it's going to, it's an acquired taste. It's going to take some time for me. I'm not sure how I feel about English teacher yet, but that did lead me down the road of Bell and Sebastian and love absolutely love Bell and Sebastian um they give the Scottish a very very good name um where's where's my my lovely Scottish Scottish fellow who always greets me from Scotland absolutely love that boy um yes oh Alec you've seen Black Midi live oh I'm so jealous I'm so jealous oh my gosh I love that song I've forgotten what it's called now but it's the lyrics go, she she moves with a purpose. Oh, what a magnificent purpose. Oh my gosh, that song is just, oh, I love that song so much. Oh, but yes. Oh, Emmeline, you know, I've got to agree, except the Smiths, 
the thing with the Smiths is I think that the Smiths are known for sort of their, I guess, so-called one-hit wonder songs, uh, such as, um, oh, no, I've just drawn a blank, obviously. It happens all the time. I listen to it all the time. <laughs> and now it's blank. Sorry, I'm just looking. How soon is now, right? Yes, yes. How soon is now? Uh, and the Queen is dead. But not for sort of their more miscellaneous songs. Like, what difference does it make? They're songs that sort of are more, very much sort of in tune with 80s British alternative sound. And so I think that is quite misleading. The, the, the Smiths, the Sims, the Smiths can be quite misleading as sort of in terms of their notoriety, I think, um, which is kind of what Kate Bush is going through right now, which regrettably has, it's, uh, it's that catch 22 of your, your favorite musicians. Kate Bush has been ruined for me, which is awful because I have at least five playlists dedicated to her and I've listened to her since I was very, very young. But now suddenly it's just not the same. <laughs> Thank you, Stranger Things. But it's sort of it's sort of the kind of thing that you want for your favorite musicians or your favorite whatever. You sort of want them to be recognized and appreciated for the artists or the individuals that they are, at least they're, what they're branding and their public image is but then when that happens suddenly it's it's not an intimate thing anymore suddenly it's a thing for everyone and when it's a thing for everyone sort of the uniqueness and sentimentality of it just sort of dissipates and so it's it's difficult to I don't know I would I I think it's just it's like a personal thing, really, it's just a personal grumpy thing, you know, just a very uh, self, self-indulged self thing that, you know, I just need to swallow the pill and get over it. But um, yes, for now, Kate Bush, oh, can't listen to Kate Bush. I mean, I do still listen to The Red Shoes, my favourite album, and The Central World, my favourite album. Um, Running Up That Hill, I've never actually liked Running Up That Hill, so it's fine. Uh, so yes, yes, but... Thank you so much to Zahara, as always, for updating the Kidological playlist. Very much appreciated. Um, <laughs> the Relic, yes, the Queen is dead, yes. Hey, oh, I am a Gold Frap fan. I am. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Gold Frap. Absolutely. Definitely a big fan. Um, oh, I listened to... What song? Is it Oh My... Yeah, it's Oh My, isn't it? I listened to it, absolutely loved it. So uh, I listened to that quite recently. It was featured in a film, I think, that I watched. I've forgotten now, but yes. Todd B. If Morrissey says don't eat meat, then I will, because I hate Morrissey. <laughs> I think everybody hates Morrissey. Um, <laughs> um, ah. I think I love to hate him. That's all. Um, <laughs> I think that's that's sort of where it lies with me. Um, Yusef, my favorite Smith song. Very interesting. My favorite Smith song is that joke isn't funny anymore. Oh my gosh, that song just moves me in ways that I cannot even describe. Absolutely love that song. Um, it's just oh my word. It moves me in the way that. New Order's Ultraviolence moves me. I love Ultraviolence. Love it so much. Especially the live performance, which they do have on Spotify. Not that I've seen them live. I haven't had that pleasure. I would absolutely love to. But that, oh, it moves me. Moves me. Anything with, like, major drums is just, oh, amazing. Tioga. Kate Bush is the number one artist in Nashville for some reason. I could never even start listening. <laughs> Kate Bush is is a mystery. Sorry, I'll get off the music thing just now. I'm so sorry. But Kate Bush, I was introduced to Kate Bush when I was in sixth form. And it was because my teacher liked Kate Bush. And so she put Kate Bush on and I thought she was absolutely horrendous. I could not understand it. 
but because I don't really like to sort of hate people for something that they've been recognized for as a talent or as a skill, I did my research. And I think when I actually just listened to more of her music, listened to more interviews, started to sort of engage with the mystery that is Kate Bush and sort of how she's divided Britain because she really and truly has. And it's incredible because she is the most isolated human being on earth who doesn't engage with public, with anyone, hardly does any shows. Well, hardly did any shows. Now she definitely does no shows and just lives the most normal life. She's like Enya, just without a castle. And I think that adds to the intrigue of Kate Bush, but I think it also helps to understand her music and sort of why her music is the way that it is. And it's really fascinating. And I think it also depends on what albums you listen to, sort of her different eras. Personally for me, I did not like the kick inside. I didn't like her early work. My Kate Bush era is her 80s and early 90s era. I think she was at her peak because she was no longer sort of like this sex symbol, I guess, in a way, sort of this mysterious sort of elvish young thing. And she was far more, I think, adventurous and far less sort of caring about public opinion and sort of how the public was going to sort of take her and so she sort of just did albums when she wanted to and she also integrated so much sort of lit excuse me excuse that so many sort of literary references such as the sensual world is was it was originally written with reference to James Joyce Ulysses which I loved I thought it was brilliant but then his estate copyrighted it so she couldn't and then the song blew up and then it was like okay fine now you can you know typical artistic integrity I guess if something makes money then it's a-okay but um yes I think that was a brilliant album The Central World highly recommend and Love and Anger brilliant song on that album The Fog oh beautiful um reaching out oh my gosh amazing amazing song and then the red shoes i absolutely love the red shoes oh just just beautiful and the short film is just oh it just it's just the most amazing thing if you can ever watch that short film that she made of the red shoes nailed it absolutely nailed it I don't think I've seen a better short film in relation to an album. Okay, maybe Florence, Florence and, um, Florence and the Machine. She did a very good uh, short films. She does very good short films for her albums. Uh, and also Angel Olsen for Big Time. That short film was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I did like that. And also Lana Del Rey, she did a very good short film for Tropicana. Oh gosh, I'm sorry, I'm so indecisive. But anyway, <laughs> sorry, I've babbled on so much. We haven't even started anything and it's already been like 23 minutes. My apologies. Um, yes, I do actually listen to Jonah Newsom. I do, I do. I love, I do like Jonah Newsom. Yes, thank you so much, Carly. Um, oh... Porter's Head. Oh, okay. I actually, I feel like I have probably listened to Porter's Head, but haven't necessarily made reference to it. Yes, Joanna Newsom is absolutely brilliant. Thoughts on The Dreaming by Kate. The Dreaming. Mm. Right, um, I think The Dreaming, okay, I love the cover. I've got a shirt <laughs> with the cover of The Dreaming. But in terms of the music, um, what's the song? Um, Don't put your heart on the break or the hat, something like that it's called. 
I do like that song. And I like Here Comes a Tenor. Um, otherwise, it's not terribly memorable for me. It's a bit too... It's a bit too out there, but also it's a bit too sort of old school Brit uh, for my taste, at least. It was it wasn't as bold, I think, as the sensual world, uh, which I think was a very bold album. And so it's not necessarily that memorable for me personally. But <laughs> yeah, I need to think about that. I don't know. I really don't know. Oh, I don't want to say anything bad about it, but it's it's not it's not my favorite. Let's just put it that way. Um, yeah, yeah, not my favorite. Definitely prefer Lionheart to the Dreaming. But yeah, great cover great cover say so that's her best cover for any album which is why it deserved a t-shirt Zahara massive attack yes massive attack brilliant absolutely brilliant I just love that ability of massive attack to combine ambient music with just things that people would actually listen to brilliant yes big massive attack fan Hello, William Bard. Hello, hello, hello. I'm I'm so sorry. I've babbled so long <laughs> about music. This is a bit, yeah, yeah. I need to, um, sorry, I'm just trying to look at your, Yusef. Um, <laughs> what's this? My art teacher used to put Jess Glynn on the background. Horrific times. <laughs> I think the only Jess Glynn or Glenn song that I actually like is I'll Be There. Um, that's that's quite a nice song. It's sort of, it's, it's, it's a nice pop song. There's nothing terribly bad or wrong with it. So yes, yes, I do. It's, it's a good song. T Sister, I like that name, T Sister. <laughs> Babushka, yes, Babushka is great. I think sometimes with Kate Bush, the thing is, is that often when I don't like her songs, the music videos, redeem the song for me and all is well all is very very well um a thank you so much yes yes I, I i could not agree more i could not agree more the yes yes you can see that i've just discovered a new feature of being able to <laughs> show <laughs> comments on the screen and now i'm sort of like a Facebook mom who's just discovered something new and I'm just going to keep clicking this. Um, <laughs> oh, J-Man, hello, hello, hello again. Lovely to see you. I've been looking out for my, my one true love also, Joshua Craig. Oh, he is here. Joshua. Yes, um, I need to get back to you, Joshua, about our Minecraft dates. I've got Minecraft now happy days um unfortunately my software ecam live does not allow me to stream videos or what you call it um like playing sort of games which i've tried i've been trying to talk to their customer service team who are actually very helpful ironically but in terms of actually being able to fulfill my wish they were regrettably not very helpful of no fault of their own. I just need to get new software for that purpose alone. So yes, hopefully YouTube pays me tomorrow and then we can do a bit of investing, but yes. Um, J-Man said, hi, Kidology. Hello, J-Man. What's your thoughts about school and its correlation with success? Because I'm really losing hope with this whole school thing. <sighs> I don't blame you for losing hope with regards to schooling at all. Um, I think... Uh, 
while I think about my feelings on that, what are other people's opinions of school? How is schooling going? Because I know that a lot of A-level students have now, well, I think school GCSE A-level students, you're on summer holidays now. Uh, congratulations on finishing. Um, so I, I hope that's all going okay in terms of being done with everything. I think there's a substantial lag between the direction in which society is heading and the schooling system which is meant to be pumping out people ready for society. And so schooling in no way seems to be prepping people for reality, firstly, and also doesn't give them the means to actually deal with that reality. Um, which is something that actually I was thinking about with regards to this whole uh, faking disorders trend, if you want to call it that, on TikTok and social media in general. Because I think when there's such a disjoint between a very integral, if not the most integral institution and system that is meant to be underpinning society and its success, when there's such a disjoint between the two, you really can't blame the people who are sort of meant to be bringing them together and are meant to be reaping the benefits of that harmonious or balanced relationship when they seek out a mean of dealing with that, if that makes sense. And so I do empathize greatly with your loss of hope. I don't think there is a convincing correlation between schooling and its correlation with and a correlation with success. I don't think that there is a good unity between that unless you are fortunate enough to be in a particular school, in a particular area, with particular teachers, which is all very much just circumstances coming together in a very unique way. I think I was very lucky, at least in sixth form, in which I, because I was a bit of an anomaly in that I'd just come from South Africa and had not, didn't really have anything to my name. And because my school ironically, didn't really have, I guess, the time to sort of catch me up with everything. They left me to my own devices, which meant that I was allowed to do whatever A-levels I wanted. And they provided me with all the resources, like all the books, the textbooks for that. And I therefore did a crazy number of A-levels <laughs> as a consequence. And I also went to I did different classes at different six forms in the region, which also helped a lot in terms of actually being able to suss out particular teachers who worked for me or didn't work for me. So I was very, very lucky relative to your everyday British student for that reason. And that really worked in my favor in terms of being exposed to what was good and what was not so good and sort of very much working around subjects in that way, which was very unique to me. Nobody else in my school got to do that. I was sort of a fish swimming out of water and somehow still swimming. Uh, it was a very exceptional situation. Um, but yes, it's... I don't really know what to say because I feel that yes, school definitely does not correlate to success in the way that it is meant to, or in the way that it could. But I don't necessarily have a solution to that or any kind of suggestions in terms of how to not lose hope with the whole thing. Because I think that is just a problem with a lot of critique around such things. Like, for instance, I was I did a video um, that will be out on the Patreon and on YouTube 
on Friday and the next week um, about Andrew Tate. And he's very big on this rhetoric of his hustle university and how school is really not going to help you in anything. And the thing is, is that even though he's um, a character, to put it mildly, he does actually make a very good and convincing and persuasive point there. And for me to then say, well, you know, he's, he's right about that, but don't listen to him, sort of doesn't make a lot of sense. And it doesn't make sense just in, in normal terms to the human mind. So the thing is, is that I can sort of say these things and complain all I want, but I don't have a solution or any kind of resolution to it, really. So I am very, very sorry that you're losing hope with this whole school thing, because I completely understand and empathize with you deeply on that, because I have most definitely lost a lot of faith. And um, yeah, yeah. But I, I do not know what to tell you. <laughs> I really don't. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, yes. Fifi says something very interesting. Fifi says that instead of going to university, I'm doing an apprenticeship from six. Uh, you think it would be better for me. Oh yeah, from sixth form, I think it would be. Yes, exactly. I think that's also something. Apprenticeships, people sort of, at least in the UK, see it as sort of um, in the same way that they see BTEC, I think stereotypically as an example of some kind of uh, failure, I guess, um, not being smart enough or not being good enough at conventional subjects. I completely disagree, actually. I think BTEC really teaches you a lot of practical skills, especially in terms of, uh, for instance, social welfare. I think that's social care and welfare. I think that, for instance, is one BTEC subject. Um, and I think apprenticeships as well also have that added benefit, at least, of you being taught particular skills, but also getting paid for those skills which university most definitely does not, and it can definitely feel like a scam, especially nowadays in which university has become so ideological. And I don't just mean in terms of there being a particular ideological strand that is dominant within academia. I think that's just been the history of academia. I think it's just a very politicized environment as a consequence, particularly of marketization since the 80s and it being seen as in the context of consumer relations and as academics providing a service as opposed to providing a means for opening the mind and a means for actually just learning for the sake of learning. I think it's become more so a, a venture that tries to take elements of sort of an apprenticeship, which is most definitely directed toward acquiring a skill and cultivating a skill in order to then be employable or to work for said company providing the ap apprenticeship or what have you. It tries to sort of take bits of that, but it really can't because that is not what the university as a concept was designed for or created for. And because of that, I think it just does not work at all. It really doesn't because in terms of university being a place that is trying to churn out people for the modern workforce, it's very unsuccessful at that. At least in the UK, it's very unsuccessful at doing that convincingly and effectively uh, and consistently because that is not what the university as a concept um, was derived for. It was, it's a place for thought, for critical thinking, to develop the skills so cherished by the ancients. And so, yeah, yeah, 
I definitely saw university, I think, in a naive way in that I saw it in that very traditional way of what the university was for, in the sense that I never went to sort of job fairs. I didn't, I was very much sort of in this bubble, which at least in Oxbridge is very convincing of keeping you in this bubble where you think that life is purely the life of the mind and you are just constantly stimulated mentally and intellectually and that's all that matters nothing else beyond that matters which is the beautiful haven of the university but regrettably in this day and age you have to emerge from that you can't just stay in it or you don't just get funded by you know Athens to think so (laughs) um it's um yeah yeah yes it's it's modern the modern university is a bit lost in terms of its identity and its purpose and I think that is going to be its downfall at least uh there's far too many people going to university university was not intended for the masses it really was not uh because it is very much about intellectualism um it was not designed for specialisms which is what it is now increasingly about about trying to create specialists but it fails miserably at that as well and i think that the modern workforce and specialism is also going to be a very very big challenge for times to come because specialization has not worked as organically as it was meant to as it was ordained to regrettably and i think we can see that with well currently the global food crisis um and farming especially specialized large-scale farming which is increasingly being privatized um but yes so yes yes i Fifi, I'm, I really do hope sincerely that your apprenticeship goes well. Um, I think apprenticeships are a great way to go, especially in terms of sort of just, I think, psychologically cultivating a sense of meaning for oneself and also feeling like there's what you're doing is actually, there's a purpose to it. I think with university, you sort of get your grades and that's great, but then it's, you know, who, who actually cares? You know, and also when you get into university, you sort of work so hard during A levels in order to get the grades, in order to get into the university. And then once you're there, nobody actually cares at all. And after you finish university, nobody actually cares because it's so easy to now pass at university. I mean, you literally just have to write your name on a page and you get marks. So there isn't really that challenge or there isn't that sort of urgency I suppose and I don't think that's the fault of students at all I think that's just the way that the modern marketized university tries to attract more students it's just it's good marketing to say that you know your pass rate is such and such um it looks good on paper and that's the important thing now not the mind so yes yes so yes i hope your apprenticeship goes well that sounds very exciting maria r says that preparing for uni entrance tests and there's so much pressure the price too it's very expensive yes oh yes and especially spending all that time prepping for a test is just um and for it to just bear no fruit afterwards there's so many youtubers i think there's one called ruby granger and another one called unjaded jade who are sort of like the perfect candidates (laughs) for oxbridge and sort of a lot of their content at least when they were at uni uh was around them trying to get into oxbridge and they did everything right, literally everything right. They were sort of the perfect candidates, but they didn't get in. And it was just quite, uh, it was quite, well, I wouldn't say heartbreaking. I wasn't that invested in them, but I, I guess sort of 
yeah, I guess sort of it was heartbreaking to see sort of these individuals, like so many, like the vast majority of people who apply to these prestigious institutions, trying so hard, investing so much of their time, of their energy and of their money into trying to get in to these institutions and just in response to that, getting a letter saying, sorry, but uh, <laughs> you didn't quite make it uh, with no real explanation as to why. So um, yeah, yeah, I think that that can be a huge blow. Um, but I think fortunately with them, they had good support networks and obviously many other opportunities. So, um, but yeah, many, many don't. And so it's very, very difficult. And yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, let me scroll down a little bit. Oh, Yusuf, I'm, I'm glad that uh, Yusuf says that beyond volunteering last week, I helped set up an art exhibition. Oh, fantastic. I have been quite bored this summer. <laughs> oh. Oh, summer is for being bored. Uh, you know, it's a time to just be very, to just romanticize your boredom. Um, actually, I was reading somewhere that young people don't smoke anymore. It's sort of like a time where like young people just like sort of hang around together, smoking. Um, what else do they do? Oh yeah, listen to Eminem. <laughs> on speakers at least that's what they do in Cambridgeshire uh, <laughs> but um yeah yeah but yes summer summer can be a bit boring um indeed it can be uh, oh Tioga you're in the military how fascinating very interesting oh can I be curious and ask what sort of induced you to join the military what what was it because I do I find that so interesting especially when I see advertisements because I see advertisements but then people who actually are in the military don't in any way seem to join the military for the reasons that the adverts seem to suggest like sort of you know camaraderie it's very much about sort of there's sort of at least the people I've met, there's a moral component to it, which I find very interesting and very intriguing as somebody who isn't, who doesn't personally find sort of an identity in that sort of sphere of life. But it is incredible because it is a very, irrespective of what one thinks of war or the prospect of war, I do think that there is something very interesting about individuals choosing, at least in countries where you can choose, choosing to put themselves in a position where potentially they could be on the front lines of warfare, especially modern warfare, which is petrifying and increasingly becoming so. So I think it is an absolutely incredible sacrifice, uh, irrespective of my views about military, military funding, all of that. Um, I do think it's incredible. So it would be fascinating to actually read that. Uh, thanks for sharing. Um, ooh, do, 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 do. <laughs> oh, gosh. Sorry, I was just reading a comment by... Um, <laughs> KL said that they were left alone like I was at school. Um, sorry about that. But you did the exact opposite, totally slacked off. <laughs> oh, yes, I think I was too petrified to slack off. Most definitely, I had no sense of identity or sense of purpose that I decided, right, this is the way that I'm going to find some meaning, something to do, you know. By then... I had given up on God, I'd given up on the prospect of making friends, didn't know what was going on, didn't know why I was even in this country. So I was like, you know what? These books, is it Edexcel, I think it was? Um, 
these these are my these are my my calling right now so yes that was that was what I did but I think I, I could have really I think this was something that the film everything everywhere all at once got me thinking about um it got me thinking about those decisions that we make which then could lead us on completely different paths like completely just the most wild paths imaginable and that really freaked me out because I think it could have I could have easily if I'd gone to a different school if I had just decided not to even open a particular textbook if I had decided to just slack off or had decided to you know what let me just go out and smoke <laughs> with some of those kids and you know just like you know live my best life how different my life could have been it's quite scary but not in a bad way it's scary in a very intriguing way because things could be just so different and you will never ever know you'll never have that that privilege of really knowing what it could be and so that always intrigues me sort of when when people's lives turn out in such a way you think sort of what decisions or what consequences of circumstance and life sort of induce them or coerce them in a particular direction as opposed to another and it's it is quite petrifying to think of because you sort of think is there such a thing as free will or autonomy or are we just pawns are we just flesh and blood sims and it's quite um sort of you can go down that rabbit hole and just never ever there's there isn't a bottom <laughs> and so that can get quite frightening but yes veronica oh hello veronica absolutely lovely to see you lovely 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 i hope were you doing exams I forget, I apologise, but I'm so happy to see you here. I missed you last week. I noticed you were not here. <laughs> so yes, it was absolutely, oh my gosh, you caught COVID. I'm so sorry. Oh my gosh. Oh no, that is terrible. That is terrible. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. Oh, I have been one of the lucky, lucky few. Um, although I've, I've been going to the gym <laughs> and... I sort of, um, I don't know, I feel a bit invincible, I think, because I haven't actually gotten ill from COVID. So I am very, very lucky. And I go to the gym and now I'm seeing more people who are wearing masks at the gym. I was wondering what you thought about that. Do you actually think, um, <laughs> do, you, do you think that there's a point in that? Or I sort of think that when you go to the gym, or you go to these social spaces where there's just so many people, so much perspiration and sweat and dirt and ick, that you just have to accept your fate. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's how I go into the gym. I'm like, you know what? Today may be the day and I'm going to accept my fate because I've decided to be here and that's on me and what will be will be. Uh... You know, I, that, that's what I think, because I see these people in their masks trying to lift weights. And I just think the absolute horror that is going on behind those masks, because, um, oh, gosh, the sweat, the inability to breathe properly. And it's just, oh, no, 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 no. Just too much drama, way too much. Um, no, no, no. But yes, I hope everybody else is staying safe. Um, I really, really do. Oh, my true love is here. Hello, Joshua. Joshua, oh, I, I have been babbling for so long. I've just looked at the time. I'm so sorry. But I wanted to ask you, I got the most bizarre email a few days ago. And it was the weirdest thing. I did not understand it. I actually, it was so bizarre that I actually took it to my therapist and I said to her, like, should I be worried? Because I'm not actually worried about this. I don't, it takes a lot to freak me out, like a lot. Like you would have to do some criminal minds season four shit to get me like actually caring. 
I really don't get freaked out by hardly anything, really. Um, I'm very much a sort of, like, show me what you've got and then, <laughs> then we'll see. So weird emails don't freak me out. So, you know, send them away, like, by all means. But I was so intrigued by this because it was just so mysterious and so miscellaneous. And I didn't understand what was being said. I think the only thing I gathered was that this person really does not like Joshua Craig. And I guess in a way I sort of worried for Joshua. <laughs> and so I, I, I got this email. And so I, I, I don't know if you would like uh, me to share it with you because you know I, I'm, I'm very much an open book at this point so um just let me know with like a thumbs up in the comments down below if you'd like me to share it um the person is anonymous because i assume that they created this uh account because it's called um oh i've forgotten what it's called I think it's Silent Admirer. I'm not sure exactly, uh, but it was very intriguing. I did not, I, I looked on Google, like at some terms, and I couldn't find anything because it was very, so ambiguous. But I was intrigued, very much intrigued. It took, it took a lot of courage, <laughs> or more so a lot of restraint for me not to respond because I just, I want to know more, but... Um, yeah, I, do, I don't think it's healthy. So uh, yes, I, I did not respond, but um, I I am intrigued because I assume that they're probably watching this live stream. I assume that they probably watch all my live streams. And so I am, it's, <laughs> it was interesting. Um, I, I can't lie about that. So um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, let me just scroll down. I'm so sorry that I'm I'm so behind. But we are going to move on to the faking disorders um, on TikTok. I saw somebody wrote a comment about Pegasus doing videos. I also do like. Um, well, I find them interesting. I wouldn't say that I like them, the videos, but I, I do find them interesting. I've been watching quite a few of them lately as a consequence. Oh, somebody's talking about Rishi Sunak. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Sorry, let me just put that, that comment by Maxine. Thank you so much for this comment. I love talking about this. Oh, I am so invested in this political turmoil that the conservatives find themselves in because I do not, alas, I don't think, I don't think that Sunak is going to win. Uh, I personally don't think so, but I do have thoughts. So I'll put that on screen just for now. Um, and whilst I just look at what people are saying about <laughs> the email threatening dear Josh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> my one and only so yes hello Dara it's so lovely to see you oh I actually oh oh I'm on 90 that sounds so fake me saying like oh I'm on 90k but I actually haven't looked, <laughs> looked at my subscriber count since um last week so like last weekend so oh that's lovely oh we're on 90k you know in my video <laughs> It's going to sound so weird. I'm probably going to have to re-record it now. Because on the video that I've got coming out this Tuesday, I actually wrote, I asked to please subscribe because it, I really want to reach 90k by the end of this year. So that's probably, I'm um, going to have to update that. So um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's going to sound a bit awkward. But yes, lovely to see you as always, Daria. Absolutely wonderful. Um, yes. Bailey Cook, my Scottish friend. Hello, hello, hello. Um, anyway, people think that going to the gym is wrong. Hmm. <laughs> I agree with Rob though. The gym is not the only place to be fit, but it is the only place where I'm disciplined enough. I do not have self-discipline. I really do not, uh, especially in terms of when I don't have a schedule, when I don't 
have sort of that feeling that other people are judging me which obviously they're not because everybody's just thinking about themselves it's sort of what, like when you go in public and you I don't know you trip and you think oh my gosh so embarrassing when actually nobody cares everybody is so concerned with not tripping themselves or is so concerned about how they look or how they appear to others that nobody actually cares about anybody else and everybody just thinks oh thank god it wasn't me so you know it's um it is that but at the same time I sort of when I'm at the gym I'm thinking right I've got to really I've got to do this because you know there's all these people depending on me doing this so <laughs> um it, it it helps whereas if I go out and I run outside firstly you know the outdoors are a mystery to me it, it's um <laughs> I like I, I like the countryside. I love the countryside. That's that is sort of I think that's where I belong. Um but in terms of exercising outdoors, I don't understand that. Um I think the gymnasium is a very good place. Um just for discipline and actually getting things done and also feeling like I'm sort of doing something. So, yes, yes. I I'm, I'm very I'm very personally pro gym. That's all. Uh, and Yusef, we need to sort out our workout schedule, uh, most definitely. Yes, uh, I think that's that's very important. No, Joshua Craig, you were not the one who made me go to a therapist. Um, <laughs> it was um, <laughs> it was the person who who sort of seems to have threatened you. Okay, we're getting lots of thumbs up. Okay, okay, we're getting lots of thumbs up. Right, okay, I'm, so I'm going to be sharing this email with you because this is just enticing. Let me just get a screenshot of it because this is some intriguing stuff. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Oh, shadow admirer, there we go. Okay, sorry, let me, let me just... Because there's parts of this that I just do not understand at all. So it's, um, do bear with me for one second. Right, let's, I think I can do this now. Okay, there we go. Okay. Gosh. <laughs> right. So I, I, I need your input because my, my, uh, therapist, uh, didn't understand sort of some of the things being referenced, which I went to her for because I was flabbergasted. But uh, nonetheless, here, here it is, here it is. Um, I hope you can all see it. So the heading begins. They're called false twins, dot, dot, dot. I do not know what that means. I have gone through the internet and I do not understand it. I really don't. So it starts off, he, he, you like him, don't you? Watching him. It's okay, I get it. It gets lonely. Now I assume that's in reference to last week's stream because last week's stream, I made it known to everybody that I actually watched <laughs> uh, Joshua Craig's shorts. Um, this is just me promoting it once again. Please do watch Joshua Craig's shorts. They are absolutely, they are, they are gold, absolute gold. Um, please, please watch them. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's my dose, it's my dose of fun. Uh, so yes, um, I assume that's what it's referencing. But I do not know. Rob, that's a his band's name I don't know I don't know what that means Rob so I can I'm my my that's his band's name oh that's his band's name I'm afraid I don't know what that means anyway so I assume that was about Joshua so obviously I was worried for his well-being um so I just ended up watching more of his shorts uh, on a loop uh, just to make sure that everything was okay. Um, <laughs> it continues. It's still early, but all things considered, I thought best to intercede for you now. Just be careful. Things get kind of weird from here on. 
I don't know what that means. Um, it's still early. But all things considered, I thought best to intercede for you now. I suppose meaning that it's still early in this uh, parasocial, uh, very public <laughs> relationship that I'm in with Joshua Craig. Uh, <laughs> um um, yeah, which we are all very much invested in. Yes, Veronica, what does this mean? <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't understand what this means. Uh, I just need to reiterate, I'm not concerned at all. This, it really, don't, <laughs> I don't, I'm not, not concerned at all. I'm just very intrigued by it. Um, I, I think I've said I have no soul. So really something like huge would have to happen for me to actually, you know, like burning down the house that's also a great song i love that song um yeah anyway um that said it continues i'm here if you need me just don't beg yours truly and that is that thoughts anyone what does false twins mean yes thank you tiago because i don't know what false twins means I'm very, um, <laughs> spilled salt, 486, mom, come get me, I'm scared. <laughs> oh my gosh, oh goodness, oh. Joshua says, I have no idea, but truth be told, I'm kind of a weird dude <laughs> in real life. Not that weird, but nobody's perfect. So it might be someone who knows me in real life, but I honestly can't say. Nolan, thank you, Talking Heads. Yes, Burning Down the House, love that song. That song was so beautifully played in um, Nymphomania, uh, Nymphomaniac, love those films. Highly recommend, uh, but you have to have a bit of a, um, a stomach for very explicit <laughs> content, but nonetheless, great film. But going back to my one and only, um, my own maniac, Joshua. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure if it's somebody, maybe it is somebody who knows you. Um, very ambiguous. I mean, I do get strange messages, but I mean, they, they don't, like it doesn't bother me. I, I find it very entertaining, very amusing, um, and it intrigues me. And this one most definitely did because it was one that um, I, firstly, whenever I do get weird emails or messages, the person is always very polite about it, always identifies themselves. Um, so, you know, they're very like proud to put a name to their email or their message, uh, which, you know, I appreciate like, you know, hands thumbs up for you because I think that that not only does it take courage but it takes some conviction and so you know I appreciate I appreciate a potential stalker who puts their name on their methods um so yes so this is I guess this is the first time where I haven't gotten any confirmation of identity which you know tickled my curiosity somewhat um and also just the wording. It's very interesting. Uh, so yeah, if I'm not on stream next week, uh, you know what's happened. Joe, <laughs> uh, Joe jo makes a very good point. Um, I want to get back to uh, Rishi, but I'm not sure it's going to replace it. So sorry, Maxine. Um, I'll scroll back and get that back up. Joe makes a very interesting po point. Is writing cryptically like this the secret to a woman's attention? Well, you see, I think this is an interesting discussion to have in and of itself because we are in communication virtually more so now than ever. And I think increasingly more so in terms of interacting with the opposite sex or with the sex or the genders that we are, we are attracted to. Um, I think inevitably it's going to be very difficult to figure out what women or what men want, especially because in order to just navigate the internet, sorry, 
sorry about that, in order to navigate the internet and in order to navigate and to try and understand this just amalgamation of information and human beings, we have to generalize in order to actually understand. And we inevitably then end up oversimplifying. And that's when you get sort of all women are like this, or this is how you attract women, or this is how you attract high value men, and how you get rid of low value men, and very much just all these generalizations, all these stereotypes, all these assumptions, which are often just based on either what is going to be most appealing for a wider audience, because that is the essence of the internet, at least social media, the social media aspect of the internet, trying to get views and trying to get attention. And therefore you are going to do those things which are going to garner more of an audience. And also just, it's, it's the way just for us to inevitably make sense of something that really cannot be fathomed or dissected, which is the individual, unique and idiosyncratic nature of a human mind and a person, which just makes it so difficult, very difficult. And because we're just so, subsumed by is that even a word oh, my apologies we are so subsumed by so many people inevitably we sort of fear investing all of our time and all of our attention into just one individual when there's the prospect that they are talking with other people that they are not as invested that they don't care as much um there's so many risks involved so much distrust um that you can't really get to the essence of an individual person and finding connections with individual people online, um, at least in the majority of cases. And so, you know, at least when it comes to me personally, Joe, writing cryptically, it gets my attention, I guess, in this way that it sort of is very interesting because it refers to things like false twins. I've never heard that reference before. I don't know what that means. And also it's very mysterious, but it hasn't piqued my interest enough that I'm actually going to respond to this or that it actually has garnered sort of my attention in a, um, I guess in a positive way. I'm very neutral to it. I mean, you know, fair enough. I'm sure I'm going to get another email after this. <laughs> another mystery to unpack. But um, yes, yes. Um, I think I'm just very personally just quite immune to such things. I know that there are definitely individuals uh, who would get freaked out by this. And I in no way, by me not being bothered, am in any way devaluing other individuals who would get worried or fearful by such things. Um, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say that I'm an, I'm an, uh, I wouldn't say that I am an anomaly, but I would say that I, I completely understand if people would get freaked out by this. Um, I just, as I've said, have no soul. So it hasn't sort of, it hasn't garnered so much attention from me that I've in any way altered sort of my life or <laughs> my online activities. Um, but yeah, I, I would love this shadow admirer to show themselves <laughs> at some point. Although, you know, there is sort of an intrigue in them not. But as long as Joshua is okay, I'm fine. Um, <laughs> you know, I was I was worried for Joshua's well-being um, because I do assume that this is about my one and only. So yes, but um, I don't know. Um, it's It's strange. Hello, Bella. Hello, hello, hello. The dot, 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 yes, the dot, dot, dots make me think it's an old person. Yes. When I read it, I just couldn't help thinking of Honey, Honey by ABBA. Uh, very, very, very interesting. <laughs> very odd indeed. But uh, 
protect here we go protect kidology at all costs i'm fine i've got a tennis racket i'm good <laughs> oh gosh uh <laughs> yeah 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 no 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 need for worry like honestly um uh this this is um <laughs> bella says oh like a fake twin flame what does that mean i'm not sure what a fake twin flame is uh, i'm afraid i'm not very up to date with such things um Yes, there is quite a creepy vibe to it. Um, <laughs> yes, there is most definitely. Yes, yes. Um, I saw something. Yes, Joe said something else very interesting. I feel like I bore woman with my honesty and straightforward ways. Hmm. You know, I, hmm, you see, I think that this is a difficult thing as well, because like I said, when we're talking with people on the internet, we inevitably have to like oversimplify things and we generalize because that is just how we can try to grapple with the internet and with so many people and being exposed to so many alleged or at least the the myth or the illusion of so much choice um which isn't actually the case i don't believe and i'd argue but i think everybody interprets honesty and straightforwardness in different ways i think there is sort of that honesty in the way of somebody saying sort of on a first date oh um I don't want children and I'm looking for a long-term relationship and I think for some people that can be interpreted as sort of honesty and straightforwardness but to others that can be interpreted as oh my goodness this is the first interaction that I've had with this person and they're already talking about this so that can be it's all very much just a touch and go when it comes to interacting with people, especially when it comes to, I think in the modern world, men and women interacting. Because what I have very much come to realize is that men and women in modern societies and in the modern context do not understand each other at all. They are having completely different conversations online specifically. I was very interested in this week, something that's gone quite viral is this uh, kickboxer, Andrew Tate, who went on to uh, Hussein Piker or Hussein Abi live stream and had a debate with him all about, and honestly, the most boring and insignificant thing to be quite honest about whether women are better drivers than men because according to Andrew Tate's lived experience women have proved to be terrible drivers and therefore he has determined that it is his truth that women therefore in general are worse drivers than men Whereas Hussein was arguing, well, just because your lived experience tells you one truth, it doesn't mean that that's the objective truth when it comes to, for instance, insurance companies having data and information, which means that they believe and that they know that men are actually more high risk relative to women because they um, are just more reckless on the road and therefore women, women pay uh, less insurance than men do. And this was the basis of their argument, really. And that was what they were arguing about for God knows how many hours. And it was interesting because, firstly, it was not that men can't talk about such things, but it was these two men <laughs> having this very, in my opinion, at least pointless argument. Because, firstly, it is such a generalization 
on both ends, to be fair. I mean, yes, there is the objective statistical evidence that many insurance firms use, but that surely differs from, at least in the United States, I'm sure, from state to state legislation around that, but also differs from country to country, depending on transportation, depending on sort of the how roads are built, what roads go where, how many highways or freeways there are, all of that. So there's just so much involved in it. And there's so many differences, I'm sure, year in and year out on um, sort of who has more accidents, etc, etc. So it was just quite a, it seemed like quite a pointless debate topic. And it also seemed very much, it, it sort of lost the point i think in many ways and in many spheres because it was it was sort of these two men going at it trying to you know outdo the other about something that really um had had no sort of input i guess from any authorities in the matter which included no sort of input from the people at the center of this very intense debate, women who have driver's licenses. So it was interesting in that sense, but it also just reflected, I think, just how disjointed all of these conversations and all of this alleged discourse that is actually, I think, very much closed discourse, how disjointed it all is. Because the fact that Andrew Tate is like blowing up I don't, now I'm just repeating the video that I'm going to upload to my Patreon on Friday. But I think all this obsession with Andrew Tate at the moment, at least on the internet, him going sort of viral in a sense, very much relates to not the plight of modern men, but I would say the plight, and I think I also find this with a lot of fresh and fit in their content, it's not the plight of modern men in as much as it's the plight of a very exclusive, very new money echelon of modern men who all know each other, are very exclusive, are very much only in contact with not modern women, but with a particular new money echelon of modern women who principally make all of their money online and are very much associated with that Instagram image and delusion of what a modern woman is and are inevitably very much focused on life as it is at this particular point in time as opposed to the reality of life which is the aging process such as the idea that modern women aren't just women in their 20s to their mid 30s but actually I kid you not, include women from their mid-30s all the way up till they end up in the fiery furnace being cremated or buried or whatever. You know, modern women are, you know, a, a big thing. And I think the same with also men. Uh, men, modern man is not just, uh, I don't know, the most desirable, uh, the sort of sexual marketplace in which men are from their sort of 20s to about their mid 30s, late 40s, who are most integrated in the sexual marketplace and are actually active participants in it. But it, it really does go way beyond that. The vast majority of your life is spent outside of this sexual marketplace for both men and women and for everyone. Yet we just seem so obsessed with it. And I think it just creates this sort of moral panic around all of that and really makes, just causes so much anxiety, I think, especially for very young, impressionable young people who have been continually let down by uh, society at large and are also now gaining all of their information more so from, and all of their news from particularly TikTok increasingly, which I think is just something that 
we have to just accept at this point i think you know we have to accept people are gaining their information from tiktok and that is what it is um whether we like it or not and so i think sort of the anxiety around it is just so conflated so artificially conflated that it's just creating this moral panic around things which really don't need that at all and i think it just causes far more harm than it does good because you know i think i think the one good thing <laughs> that I've, I've sort of heard uh sort of as a little phrase on the internet is touch grass <laughs> because i think it's very important for us to actually just in terms of what it sort of means, the euphemism, like sort of touch grass, sort of going out and sort of talking to people. I think it's so important because I think like just looking at your profile picture, Joe, if I can be so bold, I think that if you came and spoke to me in public and we had a conversation, I would, I think, I would find you very attractive. I think just going on your profile picture and I would talk to you. But in terms of sort of what you said about like, you feel like you bore woman with your honesty and straightforwardness. I think if I read that sort of online, like, I don't know if you like put that in your like bio on some dating website or something like that, I think I'd be like, oh no. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you know, that isn't really reality either uh, because you are far more than just that statement or far more than just your honesty and your straightforwardness, especially in the context of being online. And I think that is so missing online and that sort of reality of just what a human being is, which is so much more than, uh, you know, just what you are online. Um, so yes, um, I think more people should start making shorts of their men's dems and uh <laughs> like um my one and only joshua craig because uh yes joshua is so much more than his original hate comments on this channel um they have been archived don't you worry um <laughs> i'm so sorry i've talked so much we haven't even gotten to the fake tiktok disorder things um let me just read some of the comments and then we will get onto that but uh thank you so much for um your your comments and everything uh very very interesting um anyway oh so many interesting questions oh jay man you also you always ask the most fascinating questions and i just know that if i answer all of them i'll just go off on a tangent absolute tangent but just for my editing purposes i'm going to put this question on the screen just so that when I edit I can see it and then I can come back to it if I don't in this stream next stream um because such an interesting question um oh okay <laughs> magma <laughs> that was brilliant this email could be Jordan Peterson after a nifty benzo binge <laughs> looking to release the tension <laughs> oh my gosh imagine if jordan peterson oh my gosh <laughs> um <laughs> wow um yeah i i don't know um <laughs> if it were tammy peterson i might hmm, i'd respond but uh jordan peterson um he's not my type uh <laughs> So sorry if we're going to be that if i'm going to be that superficial um yeah i think i think tammy peterson is a very beautiful woman i do uh she has a very intriguing facial features which i find very interesting sort of like they've been like carved in a way um very very sort of unique beauty and aura about her especially when she speaks um which she doesn't do very often, at least online. But um, there was a video, Jordan Peterson and her discuss discussing their marriage and how it works for them, which was very interesting just to watch. Um, 
interesting specifically in the way that um, his sort of, at least his advice online and sort of his interpretation of woman and beauty and what's attractive, what isn't, how young men should navigate the sexual marketplace in absolutely no way corresponds with his relationships or his relationship with his wife, his, um, when he was in the sexual marketplace, if we can call it that in very crude terms. Uh, it's just, it's intriguing how, how reality and the virtual reality just are just so distinct from each other yet we are so invested in virtual reality more so than we are in reality itself now which I do think is worrying uh you know I sort of I have a hope with young people that they'll grow out of it which is why sort of things like TikTok and young people doing weird things on TikTok doesn't worry me a lot because I think you know you're young um you'll get out of it. But it's when adults, like real proper adults who've sort of lived life, like, you know, hardcore, are still being swayed by virtual reality more so than by reality itself. That's when things are worrying. And I think Jordan for me is at least proving more and more so that he is increasingly incapable of distinguishing as effectively between virtual reality and reality. Um, hopefully Tammy brings them down to earth at some point, but um, I'm sorry, Emmeline, I'm, I know I'm talking about, I know I'm talking about him again, I'm so sorry. Um, but yes, anyway, I said I was going to read comments. Uh, oh, um, Baby Cook, the stuff that I have seen on TikTok is ridiculous. And I think that is a good segue <laughs> into um, the our next topic. Um, a very, very good segue um, because I have now just, yeah, I've lost the plot here, I think. Uh, let me just delete that uh, and let's get into this little, little gobbit. Um, unfortunately, I can't play you these incredible videos because, you know, alas. But this is something that I have been thinking about because of, well, just because it just seems to be everywhere. It seems to be incredibly trendy at the moment. Not just trendy in so far as people on TikTok making TikToks about their oftentimes self-diagnosed disorders, most popular or most likely among them is Tourette's and filming their particular tics that they have, but also in terms of particular creators, most notably, I think somebody referenced the creator Pegasus making videos, but also there's particular content creators on YouTube who make response videos to this, which is primarily, um, I would call it, this is, <laughs> oh, I don't like to say this, but I'd say that it's very much sort of content that is quantity over quality of content. There's little to no research behind the videos. It's just primarily, um, in all cases that I've seen, young men who are YouTubers who play a video game and then do a voiceover and then comment about some TikTok, which primarily focuses around Gen Z and the worst of Gen Z and also this fake disorder or fake disorder cringe and also about leftist YouTubers, specifically video essayists that they've sort of gotten into and also those uh, sort of ones who comment about um, gender and also about sort of the straights are at it again or I'm concerned about straight people on TikTok, sort of those sorts of things. Um, I think the queer Kiwi, these 
particular channels. Uh, one's called a Cheeto, I think. There's Pegasus. Um, you sort of, you, you know them because they all make the same, exact same content. Their thumbnails are exactly the same. Their headings and titles are the same. Their videos are all like eight minutes, maximum like 10 minutes. And they churn one out at least once a day. And you never see their face. Their content is all sort of about, it's very uh, sanctimonious, very uh, much focused on sort of calling out young people for doing things. Oftentimes, I will admit, yes, stupid things online. And uh, yeah, it's not very good, in my opinion, mainly because it is just, it is just about quantity over quality, which is why I think a lot of them made videos about, because uh, they all, I don't know if they have like a WhatsApp group, but they all make videos about the same creators sort of around the same time. So they made one about Tara Mookney. They made one right now, I think they, they're moving on to now making videos about Anna Marie Fonseca, uh, who made a video about Andrew Tate. And it's quite clear that they don't do any research really into sort of these video essays and what they do, irrespective of whether I agree with what they are saying. For instance, I hardly ever, well, I wouldn't say hardly ever, but like, I, I'm not like sort of like a follower, I guess, of say Tara Mookney, but her videos are incredible, very insightful, very interesting, very well done. I mean, the quality of them is just out of this world, like amazing, absolutely amazing. You know, I, yeah, yeah, brilliant videos, highly recommend um, just for like the interest and the educational value. And also just Tara is very, Great content creator. And so then for like one of these channels, just make a video um, sort of just saying that like, like just all these, like really just so poorly researched uh, and just so crude is quite dismal considering how many views these channels get. But anyway, enough of that tangent. Um, basically, I have a lot of thoughts about this because I think that, oh, sorry, somebody said, can you remove some of the things on the screen? I barely see you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Is, is it this screen? Or well, maybe it's my last screen. I know there were so many things on that screen as well. But yes, um, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm a little black girl in the center. Um, so yes. But in terms of, um, Sorry, I'm just scrolling down the comments, just see what people are saying about this. I'm so sorry for missing comments. Oh my gosh, I got a super chat. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Vote 111111. Very much appreciate the super chat. Thank you so much. Just a quick compliment. Kitty has big booty energy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not very up to date with the lingo of um, our generation, but I'm, I'm assuming, I'm thinking big booty energy, is, is that sort of Megan the Stallion, Cardi B? Um, <laughs> I, I've, I've never associated myself with those two women. Um, I would be absolutely honest, I guess. <laughs> Wow, um, but thank you so much. That that is wow. Thank you. <laughs> so yes, um, but anyway, uh, thank you so much for the super chat. Very much appreciate any and all super chats. Thank you so so very much. Very kind of you. Um, so yes, yes. I'm just looking at comments that people are saying. Um, Lord's Need actually says something interesting. Dare dare I venture into the Lord's Need? Oh, we're gonna we're gonna do it. Anyway, Lord's Need says, I bet none of these kids faking a disability are non-white because non-white people in this lefty TikTok sphere already have virtuous lack of privilege credibility 
And that's why white kids fake it. Um, interesting point. I'll get back to that. I'll leave that on screen. I will leave that on screen. Because I do think that that is an interesting thing. Because I think that the thing with at least the left that I've noticed, at least the left online, and very sort of leftist content and the sphere, the community, which very much relates to young people, is that I guess if we're going to speak in very generic terms, sort of white people um, as a very, which I don't really like saying because it, there's so much diversity uh, within all groups, but just, just for the sake of ease, white people, I think on the left, the left is very reluctant to allow its white community members to have a sense of identity which they can be proud of, or which is something that they can sort of exhibit these same kind of energy that one sees within patriotism or nationalistic pride and I think this has caused an identity crisis among a lot of white liberals and white left-leaning individuals particularly I think in the sort of at least not necessarily the economic middle class but I think increasingly as we are all becoming far more literate far more educated I think at least um, in terms of our navigation within virtual spaces there's far less distinguishing people in sort of class stratification so I sort of when I say sort of like middle class the virtual middle class I sort of mean in that more sort of uh, intellectual way I guess in that more uh, sort of just uh, yeah 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 far more um, non-physical way so I think that this is sort of an inevitable thing in a way and I don't think it helps in any way to blame and shame these people who are very young and most of them have grown up on the internet and don't know anything sort of beyond it when there is such an emphasis to find meaning and an identity especially online but then a particular segment of the modern particularly western population is being denied a means of finding pride in identity that isn't associated with being either queer or being a quote-unquote victim um, and I don't use that lightly um, sort of being somebody who is at a disadvantage socially and therefore that is sort of what is only on offer to particular people so I do think Lord's Need you make a very good point there uh, not that I agree with all of it but you make a good point there which I think is one of the reasons why I'm not as inclined to call this kind of content cringe or to believe that these people are rarely that all of them are really faking disorders or faking tics, especially when we look at Tourette syndrome specifically, because I think there's a lot of, there's so much that medical professionals don't know about Tourette's and so much that inevitably the internet is doing to influence our neurological understanding and neurological everything and our minds and psychology in ways that we do not understand at all and that is happening at a far greater speed than 
we actually have time to keep up with in and of ourselves. So I think that a lot of this is inevitably just in the context of the internet about attention, not just with this content, this kind of people making TikToks about their disorders or about their disability, especially when it's been self-diagnosed in the way that most of these have been, but also in people making response videos to it because these people are making real hard bank on making these compilations and making these call out videos. So, you know, it's not, um, it's not as sanctimonious a venture as it may appear with regards to these particular creators who make these particular uh, videos with the most ghastly thumbnails I have probably ever seen. Um, just very unnecessarily exaggerated and horrid. But um, yeah, yeah, it's... Let me just read the comments uh, before I keep going on. <laughs> Sigourney, absolutely beautiful name. Love Sigourney. Makes me think of Sigourney Weaver, who I absolutely love. Another one of my celebrity crushes. <laughs> um, have you heard of maladaptive daydreaming? I have not. I'll be intrigued to discover what that is, actually. Starring that. Thank you very much. Um... <laughs> Spilled salt 486. Yesterday my lip got stung by a bee. It's the size of a quarter and I've never looked better. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's brilliant. <laughs> oh my gosh. Lana Del Rey will be getting onto that one soon, I'm sure. Um, uh, yes. Anyway. Oh my gosh. Yeah, people are actually agreeing with the Lord's need. I have not seen this happen before. It's fascinating stuff. <laughs> Oh yes, boat one 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 says um, <laughs> says that uh, Jamari comes to mind. Yes, I've seen Jamari, a Cheeto. There's one who I do kind of like, who I do quite like. It's called Sensitive Society. He's a very nice young man. Um, uh, he's 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 very. I, I feel that there's there's a lot more consideration and a lot more self awareness and a lot more self-reflection in his commentary and in his videos. Um, you know, I don't have a problem with people playing video games over their voiceovers, but I think at, at least make make a good voiceover. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's, that's my only gripe with that. And I think sensitive society makes a good, a good effort uh, in voiceovers and in actually trying to formulate arguments and also willing to admit when his opinions are potentially like wrong or um, when he's reflected on them and changed his mind sort of those things and I think that's that's very nice to see especially with content which is being produced daily um it's um yeah, I think there's, it's so easy to just fall into that sort of hole of it just being very, very low quality. And I don't just mean in t terms of the production value, I mean low quality in sort of the voiceovers specifically, most importantly. So yes. Um, ooh, interesting question. Uh, what are my thoughts on Philosophy Tube? Um, I will star that. Uh, thank you so much, Shriyash. Very, very interesting question. I have lots of thoughts on Philosophy Tube. Uh, very excited for The Prince, which is Philosophy Tube's play that is was written by Philosophy Tube and uh, is going to be showing in London. I'm not going to go to it live, but um, I got a subscription to... There's... Uh, a, I've forgotten what it's called now. I haven't been on it. I got a subscription just so I could watch the play. But there's sort of like a streaming service that Philosophy Tube 
has with um, Lindsay Ellis and some other prominent individuals within the left tube sphere of things, sort of the big names. And um, yeah, it's very, very interesting. So I look forward to that. Um, so yes, yes, very, very interesting individual is our Abigail. Um, Oh, thank you so much, moderators, being very vigilant. Um, oh, sorry, I'm just scrolling down. I think I'm so behind <laughs> on everything. Oh, very interesting point. Lilliput95 says, I have not fake disorders. Uh, I have not fake disorders and the constant self-doubt of whether or not I actually have them or I'm just being lazy, stupid, entitled. Right, I think I understand what you're saying there. Um, right. This is another thing that really irks me about this notion that people are faking their disorders because all the videos that I've watched even videos that are by individuals who have been diagnosed by a pro medical profession uh, professional with a particular disability particularly with Tourette's and are medicated for their Tourette's depending on the severity of the symptoms um All of them add some form of disclaimer which says that this is just their opinion about said individual on TikTok making a particular video. Even about the most prominent alleged faker of Tourette's, of Ticks and Roses, I believe they are called. And they've been cancelled very recently uh, because of allegedly faking their tics. And yeah, this is a difficult one to speak about because I, I don't, as I'm sure you can tell, I do not have Tourette's um, or any tics. And I sometimes I feel that, uh, well, no, I can talk about things that don't necessarily directly affect me. Uh, in a respectful way. So uh, do bear that in mind as my own personal disclaimer to this. I feel that it's very hard to tell from firstly the internet, but also from something as crude and short as a TikTok, whether somebody is faking something or not. And also when people are putting up a TikTok or something like that, it's all very stylized inevitably because I think in any form of social media, whether that be TikTok, whether that be YouTube, whatever, you are inevitably looking for views. So I think this like sort of argument that people are faking disorders for attention online is just a, a, quite a tautological argument because it's, um, I mean, that's what everybody's doing, even just just people, who even write a comment online, it's a form of wanting attention. And that's not a bad thing in and of itself. And particularly with these people who are, in most cases, very young, most of them are underage, right? And I think inevitably, if you had given teenagers back in the 1950s an iPhone and TikTok and said, knock yourselves out, imagine the kind of shit that we would be exposed to today so i think this idea that this generation is like the worst generation yet and that they are doing just terrible things and that they are just such a disappointment to humanity is just such a false argument i think i think i mean i don't really know am i am i gen z i say that i am gen z but i think like i'm like sort of the oldest i was born in 1997 so i don't really know or particularly care but I think that this Gen Z, as in like sort of the young Gen Z, I think they get a very, very bad rap online. Unnecessarily so. And I think that 
for me, if anything, it's disappointing to see individuals who I think at least in terms of how they articulate themselves online, I assume that they grew up without smartphones, without the internet, and I've sort of lived the best of both worlds. I think it's it's disappointing to me that such individuals then think it's perfectly okay to judge from a sort of ivory tower that the people who they are judging have not had the, I guess, the... Uh, the double-sided privilege of experiencing. And there's no rules to the internet, especially for, I mean, it's basically anarchy. Social media is anarchy, uh, to be perfectly honest. And even when it is censored, I mean, it's censored for the most bizarre reasons. Certain things are censored and then, you know, on YouTube you have the most outrageous family vlogging content and it's just, it makes no sense whatsoever. And so you have this medium, social media, where everybody is trying to interact for attention. And then you have the added bonus of there being absolutely no regulations in place beyond that of, we need more people on the site in order to garner more revenue. It's all about money. Sorry. And then, you sort of somehow expect these individuals to come out of that as fully developed, rational, uh, incredibly selfless, well-rounded, put together citizens. It, it just, it doesn't work that way. It really doesn't. And it's, Yeah, I think there's just, there's so many factors involved in it, especially as Lord Need put it in so many words. Um, the fact that all of these individuals seem to come from the same, at least on appearance, um, I don't actually know, none of us do actually know, um, but from, at face value, seem to come from the same very broad demographic and... It is a demographic which is very much, I think, at least online, denied positive identification beyond the sphere of uh, queer identity. So, yeah, yeah, I think it, it's just, it's sort of, I don't know, it's like there's all these ingredients being added to a batter, to make a batter, and it's gonna make a cake, but then everybody somehow expects that all of these ingredients are not gonna actually make a cake, but are going to, it should make, uh, I don't know, a Starbucks, something like that. It's sort of, you know, you have all these ingredients together. Obviously, the consequences are going to be such and such. What did we expect? Um, especially as people are being, parented increasingly by not their parents and their parents values in as much as by the internet and also by schools who are not necessarily uh, parenting but are sort of now more so babysitting than anything else but it's just sort of what what do you expect if and I say that very lightly if these individuals are faking because in the majority of cases that I've seen that I've watched, and I've watched a lot of these TikToks. I don't feel that these people are faking in the way that they sort of are sitting down and devising a way to go viral on TikTok. I really don't think so. I think that these individuals, even if they do not have Tourette's, for instance, that they are, they believe that they do they believe that there is something abnormal about them based on either what they've seen online, based on the plethora of information that is now increasingly replacing medical professionals who are increasingly becoming inaccessible to not only young people, but to the population at large. Healthcare is increasingly just 
becoming a lovely little boat <laughs> sailing away for so many individuals and especially for young people. I mean, I, for instance, I, I wouldn't even, there's no, I guess there's a lot of things, like if I read online, there's a lot of things that would suggest that I have ADHD, right? Um, I don't have the money nor the means to go to a medical professional and to get professionally diagnosed, so I'm not going to. Uh, it also, at least for me, doesn't seem to be affecting my life. Um, and so the likelihood of me going and getting diagnosed very unlikely to ever happen because it really doesn't, it hasn't affected my life. But potentially I could have ADHD. But for other people, it does affect their life. And for other people, their belief that they may have ADHD, their belief that they may actually have Tourette's, their sudden inclination to exhibit particular tics um, at particular times, that may be their truth. Gosh, I sound like Andrew Tate now. <laughs> but that may be their truth to such an extent that it is far more viable than the actual truth of the matter. And I think that this is just a broader problem of sort of truth and a broader problem of um, reality and uh, virtual reality and also just of I think a lot of problems involved in identity and with identity in this day and age and sort of who is allowed an identity and who isn't and the criteria associated with particular communities and gaining access to them or not and sort of this perception that you have to be a part of a community otherwise what are you doing or especially with young very impressionable people in which increasingly the status gain from being a part of particularly an online community is so much greater than being a part of a community in the real touch grass world of things. So I, I don't know. I think there are just so many factors and I'll link an article that I actually um, read well, keep reading for some reason. I read it a lot. It was published in The Guardian. I'll link it. It's called um, The Unknown is Scary. Why Young Women on Social Media Are Developing Tourette's Like Ticks. And the subheading reads, Doctors have been surprised to see young adults developing ticks and seizures that usually start in childhood. Social media has been blamed, but the reality is more complicated. And I think this is very interesting. And this article is very interesting, so I will be sure to definitely link it uh, for you to read. And I might actually, actually, I, yeah, I have written a script. So I've written so many scripts. <laughs> uh, it Sometimes it's like, oh, did I? But yes, I have written a script about this. I was only going to make a video a bit later once this whole trend of people commenting about faking illnesses online and young people uh, faking disorders online uh, sort of blew over. But I, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. So I may make a, a video about it because there are some very interesting cases of individuals who have, for instance, there's in this article, a young woman, <clears throat> excuse me, in this article, a young woman developed a functional neurological uh, syndrome in 2020 which now means that she is in a wheelchair and this happened in later life as an adult and it's seemingly online it would seem fake but in terms of it actually being this individual's uh reality now at this particular time and given the broader context and information that is given about it in sort of this long form content of an article as opposed to like a 30 second TikTok, um, at least to me, it definitely doesn't seem fake. So I think there's just so much about mental health 
and about psychology and about disabilities that we just are not privy to as the public and also that medical science is increasingly discovering, increasingly researching and increasingly diagnosing in a variety of different ways. And I think the internet, social media and psychology are not good bedfellows. I, I, I don't think anything is a very good bed, bedfellow on this channel, clearly, but I don't think that they are very good bedfellows. But I sort of don't see any other option or alternative for a lot of people, especially when medical information and medical specialisms are so exclusive and are very much only accessible to those who have the means, the time, and yeah, the means, the money to actually access it in the first place, which the vast majority of the modern population do not have. So um, that's just my long, lengthy tangent on that. Um, so yes, I will go to the comments. I have missed so much. Oh, interesting. Mariama, beautiful name, says, intersectionality halted at white people, at least for leftists. White people cannot be proud of their whiteness. Saying this as a black person. Um... I don't know if I'm reading this correctly. Are you saying that white people can't be proud of their whiteness? Or are you saying, is that in relation to the first part of your sentence, intersectionality halted at white people, at least for leftists? Oh yeah, 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 sorry, sorry. I understand now, sorry. My apologies, Mariama, my apologies. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, intersectionality halted at white people, at least for leftists who consider white people unable or incapable of being proud of their whiteness. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do, I, I do. There's many flaws of intersectionality, which I think is something that notably uh, the alt-right has capitalized on in a very effective way, at least for its particular agenda, agenda uh, and it's something that I think the left has very much um, neglected, neglected in such a way as to then now, it seems that on, on the left, if you are just, you know, your, <laughs> your average Joe on the left, it's very hard to navigate an identity that isn't deemed offensive, or problematic, very difficult. Um, my hat's off to anybody on the left who has been able to do that uh, because there's so much going on on the left, which I think is why it is so difficult for the left to actually get beyond the internal problems and the internal dialogue and confrontations it is having with itself and with where it wants to go and what it wants to do in a way that the right isn't as preoccupied with, um, at least in very generic terms. I think in the UK, at least now looking at this Tory or the Conservative leadership uh, election, it's very interesting seeing how ideologically lost the Conservative Party in the UK is, especially with both the two remaining candidates, um, Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss, our cheese queen. Um, there's That's basically with reference to this meme um, when Liz Truss was a foods and agricultural minister. She gave this speech. Basically, Liz Truss is not um, an orator. She's... she's <laughs> Her talking, uh, she's not very, it's not, it's not her strong point. But um, a few years ago, she gave the speech at a Conservative Party conference and 
her speech includes this amazing soundbite of her just looking directly into the camera and saying, we import two thirds of our cheese. That is a disgrace. And the anger on her face. (laughs) I think also just the response of the conference, they didn't know what was going on. Like whether this was actually a real human being or a robot talking to them. And just the sort of, the the sporadic clapping that ensues and then stopped and then everyone clapped and was like, wait, no, wait, what? (laughs) She gave no indication visually that she was of, of, of sort of when to like laugh, when to respond, when she was joking or not, because I don't think she was actually joking in this whole speech. But anyway, enough of that tangent. Um, but it's, it's interesting to see, at least in the UK, how the Conservative Party is so lost ideologically, because both of these candidates are invoking this notion of bringing Thatcherism back to the people which is very interesting because at least based on both of their speeches, neither of them know what Thatcherism is. And also none of them seem to appreciate um, the the fact that Thatcherism is, its legacy is very much here with us today, but that Thatcherism, at least ideologically, sort of went beyond its capabilities and went the consequences of Thatcherism have sort of outpaced anything that Thatcherism could have imagined. And Thatcher very naively had considerable faith in the morality and the ethical standing of the financial sector, which clearly now uh, was very naive and very misplaced. And I don't think even Thatcher herself could have foreseen what her belief in the financial sector's interpretation of uh, her particular strand of neoconservatism could have ensued into. So um, it's interesting that they they both think that they're going to bring Thatcherism back, whatever that means, who knows. But uh, it's, it's interesting to see, at least in the UK, how actually when the right starts to invoke ideology it loses people and it has definitely lost a lot of people in the UK by trying to create this identity around a very misguided, nostalgic look at the good old days of right-wing politics in the UK. Um, I can't really speak for the US. Uh, It's very, very different in the US, obviously, very different even in uh, South America, very different, very interesting at the moment, uh, especially looking at uh, Brazil. But yeah, it's, um, I think that's definitely something that the right has had in their favor relative to the left, at least in terms of online. Um, But yes, enough of my babbling on, I do apologize for that. Um, Let me scroll all the way down. I'm so sorry for missing comments, I really am. Uh, Vagabond, lovely to see you. Joshua Craig, my birthday is February 17th, 1997. Um, <laughs> I don't know what my side, I don't know anything about signs, <laughs> I'm afraid. I'm so sorry. I don't know what sign that is. I'm not very good or up to date with any of those signs, I'm afraid. Oh, very interesting. Thank you so much for adding this. Les us more fair. Oh, lovely name. Beautiful profile picture as well. Is that a pink bee? I love that. Anyway, Les us fair says, I have Tourette's and have researched this stuff a lot. To be honest, I don't think most people are faking. It's more about developing sociogenetic symptoms. Yes, yes. Oh, brilliant. Starred comment as well look at that really invoking my true facebook mom skills here that is very interesting because that is what this guardian article that i referenced really emphasizes sort of environmental factors and also these socio genetic elements influencing 
sort of the development, particularly in sort of later life, of particular symptoms, which are, if they are diagnosed by a professional, the professional puts it down to Tourette's because that's sort of all that medical science is up to date with and hasn't yet sort of developed in the way of actually seeing the impact of virtual spaces and reality and the consumption, the greater and increasing consumption of that on the human brain, particularly on very young, not just impressionable, but just young growing brains and sort of what that means. And so, yes, thank you so much for that comment. I very much appreciate that because I'm definitely, in terms of somebody who is, who doesn't have such a disability, um, sort of thank you so much for putting that. That's, yes, the comment is started on the screen. Very much appreciate that. Thank you so much, Lazarus Fair. Um, ooh. Oh, hello, Vagabond. Hello. I don't know if I've said hello. I said it in my head just now when I saw Vagabond. Lovely to see you again. <laughs> oh. Leaf says, there is not, there is not a lot of neutral slash positive perspectives on what it means to have ADHD. All of its negatives. Uh, yeah, I didn't. I don't think I worded that very well. Just um, I apologize for that. In terms of sort of the things that I was um, saying about my very personal things. Um, oh, I hate. I hate saying that I'm an anomaly or anything like that because I'm really the most normal, <laughs> everyday, boring person uh, out there. But um, at least sort of in the things in. I think I sort of am quite, my life is very, I'd say quite, for the modern experience, I think quite exceptional. I sort of don't have, I don't have any like family ties and relationships in my life whatsoever. It's just me alone on this ship. Um, you know, sort of like, Jack Sparrow in Davy Jones' Locker, sort of just just me and the crabs, uh, that is it. So I sort of don't have to, or don't have those expectations of sort of family interactions, of having people dependent on me, of being dependent on other people, of sort of having to organize my life around other people and I also am very isolated from society, very isolated just in terms of, I sort of work from home. I, um, yeah, I work from home. The only interaction I have is when I go and like volunteer, but that is very much sort of just in a little shop with a little group of people, nobody sort of, you know, I have very exclusive, individuals who are my friends who I interact with and even then they all know that I will not interact with them for months and then suddenly out of the blue uh, we will catch up on like life and everything right so I live quite a, in a very a very self-indulgent and very particular way that is not in any way dependent on the conventional social interactions and social expectations that the vast majority of people who I observe in this world are obliged to do. And, you know, on the one side, it's, it, does, it does sadden me and it does, um, you know, make me sad that I don't sort of have those ties and don't have sort of those family things, especially when it comes to holidays like Christmas I'm very like ugh. and in summer sort of seeing everybody out it makes me very much just closed off and very very um misanthropic but in general it does mean that sort of with things that I know would be a problem in the world and in those sort of social obligations that the vast majority of people have 
I don't have those problems. I can very much make life work for me. I'm not sort of working around society in the way that the vast majority of people have to do and are doing. So that was what I meant more so in that for me, I am in a very, very fortunate situation where even if, because I do think, well, again, I don't care to self-diagnose or anything, but in terms of things that people have said to me, uh, especially my friends uh, have said to me about sort of my behavior, uh, sort of the things that I, I do, the things that sort of uh, worry me. In terms of the medication that I'm on for particular things uh, that I will not go into, but um, it's the implication or the, the, the likelihood is there, um, at least according to outside voices and outside people, But it isn't something that worries me personally because of the way that I live and the way that I interact with people. And it hasn't really gotten in the way of anything. Like I was thinking while I was speaking just now, for instance, I, uh, not that this has anything to do with sort of um, a disability or a disorder in any way, but for instance, I never open my mail. Uh, I have never in my entire life, I've never opened an envelope, ever, never have, never opened an envelope with a bank statement, with any, anything, Um, and it hasn't been a problem for me, because firstly, I don't have a credit card, Um, I believe they exist, but I don't believe in them, Um, (laughs) so I don't have a credit card, Um, and so I sort of know what sort of bank statements are going to like come in the post so it doesn't really phase me at all if I need to like check my banking I'll go online um and I also don't sort of have like family and all of that where like sort of mail is important or anything and um so I'm in a very exceptional circumstantial situation where sort of there's no like doom or die if I don't open my mail which I have never in my life done I don't think I've ever opened an envelope. Um, So, (laughs) um, you know, it's just that that sort of stupid little example. There's certain social obligations that other people have to do that I really don't have to worry about or be concerned about. Um, So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was sort of what I meant. Uh, I hope that makes sense, Leif. Um, Yeah. Anyway, babbled on for so long here. Uh, we haven't even gotten onto veganism yet. Um, uh, oh, Maria says something interesting. Uh, Maria says, I feel like nowadays it gets difficult to just enjoy things because of that self-diagnosis trend. I recently saw this video about how the reason why people love being in water, sea or the ocean is because the waves do something to your brain in this way and that way and it soothes your anxiety and ADHD, ADHD, pardon me, and whatever else. I found myself thinking, why can't we just enjoy that feeling of waves? Why does there have to be a scientific reason for everything that we do, that we enjoy? Can't we just simply like it? Maria. Actually, do I have sound effects? I think I do. tried to do a sound effect of an applause I don't know if that works my apologies but anyway um applause 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 I could not agree more and I blame Michelle Foucault for this um (laughs) very irrationally I can't blame one individual for this but I blame Michelle Foucault for this um I blame uh specializations for this I blame this need to rationalize everything this modern desire and obsession with the accumulation of 
knowledge at all costs, at the cost of happiness, at the cost of this idea that, what is it, ignorance is bliss. Um, I think a lot of happiness and a lot of satisfaction is based on actually the human reality of not knowing and admitting to not knowing and just being subsumed in ignorance. I think it just makes life so much easier. It makes moving from one day to the next so much easier. And I think inevitably when we have this need and this desire increasingly to provide a reason for something and to provide a label and a scientific label for something, it creates so much divis division and it creates so many issues when it comes to it actually confining people and debilitating them in the way of believing that they can't do something or that they can't think a certain way or what have you. And it's really constraining and puts people in boxes which needn't be there. And it also then, I think, where I empathize with people who have, for instance, there's lots of very educational videos out there of people who actually have been diagnosed since childhood with Tourette's as we traditionally know it. And them having channels where they are sort of very much like educating about Tourette's, for instance. It sort of devalues the actual box, the actual circumstantial box that such individuals are in just by fact of actually having this disability or having this disorder. And I think there's like a very fine line between it, but I also think that it's really not helping anyone and it's not helping society. I think especially the most obvious example is obviously um, sexuality and the rationalization of sexuality in which now everything is labeled and it's just so constraining. Like I remember just like in South Africa, in my girls boarding school, the things that went down in an all girls boarding school, uh, you can imagine. None of us knew what on earth this was. Um, I'd never heard of lesbianism, homosexuality, bisexuality, what have you. But it was glorious, okay? Um, and, you know, we all had a really good time. I'll make it sound like this was like, <laughs> it really isn't <laughs> like that. Like, um, just in terms of like, you know, holding hands, cuddling, kissing each other, um, examining each other's bodies, um, all of these sorts of things that there was no label for. And it just seemed like a very just normal thing that all girls did with each other and it was fine. And, you know, I had this like major obsession with Meryl Streep and was absolutely besotted with Meryl Streep. And the whole world had to know about it at my boarding school. Everybody knew that I loved Meryl Streep, that Meryl Streep was my world, that I was obsessed with Meryl Streep and nobody labeled it. And there was no, I, you know, none of us knew what lesbianism or homosexuality or uh, same sex attraction was like, it didn't even like sort of feature in our lives. And also because there were no boys around, like, you know, this sort of, there wasn't really that, that featuring of like, even like boys exactly. So it, it was very innocent and it was, you know, there was no shame in it either. And then I came to the UK, oh boy. <laughs> and suddenly I was just exposed to all these labels and all this rationalization and all this community boundary creation around particular identities and how you therefore have to act and think according to particular labels that you are aligned with. And it confused me so much. And it made me so ashamed at first of 
sort of the feelings that I had felt and continue to feel for women and I was really confused and then I was like oh well I'm a lesbian I must be a lesbian and then I was attracted to men and I was like oh my gosh this means I'm not a lesbian but I'm a heterosexual but oh my gosh that's not a good thing to be in this context and oh my goodness and you know what now I'm just like you know what you know it is what it is you know <laughs> whatever it is who cares it does not matter um and it really just you know it really shouldn't like it just you know I'm attracted to men, women, whatever, um, who cares, but it's just, I totally agree with you on that, Maria, there's just so many labels, and it's just so, there's just so many, not, not labels, I'm sorry, um, quoting you, there's, there's just this need to have reason for everything surrounding what we do, all of our actions, all of our dispositions, and, yeah, yes. I don't think society in general has offered a good alternative to us now, at least online, virtually creating our own reason for things because it is just anarchy. So what what do we expect um, at the end of the day? Um, but yes, very, very good point. Uh, Oh, I have not actually good segue into our veganism conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Tioga. Um, I have not seen The Promised Neverland. I need to see it. Actually, is it on Netflix? I feel like I've probably added it to my watch list on Netflix. An increasingly growing watch list. Uh, <laughs> Netflix has um, become a bit a bit dry lately. Well, not dry, just it's um, I don't know. It's interesting. They've got this new show on Netflix called I've forgotten what it's called now, but it's um, all about individuals. Well, there's this designer who goes into people's homes and creates a sex room or a sex dungeon or playroom for couples looking to spice up their intimate lives and I have lots of thoughts um I will probably be making a video on kids clips about it um for a fortnight's time because I do have thoughts because for me it just represents everything wrong with our modern sexual relations with each other um <laughs> but it's interesting show interesting show uh but yes let me move on. Uh, ooh. Very interesting point, Coscaro Drift. Very interesting point. Coscaro Drift says, I think the trouble with the left is that it is also against nationalisms. I think leftists who are from oppressed countries have an easier time because they get to play the country slash culture card yes oh exactly yes as soon as you are on the left and you are in a particularly um modern western context and you are also um you look white um you're done for um <laughs> There's, there's, there's no way to be appreciated by society unless you um, spice up your identity and your image. Uh, and the internet is a brilliant place for doing that. Um, so, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't blame people for doing that online because I think, you know what, considering our society and what it values, considering the nature of the internet, considering the things that people need to do to actually be deemed intriguing online and to garner the views and the attention which we all seek. I mean, it's it's gonna happen. So I'm not inclined to blame 
people outright or to like shame them or say that they're bad people or that they're evil people for doing that because what what do we expect just with the tools and the arsenal that we have given people particularly young people we've sort of given them toys and we've said like go play but we haven't really instructed them in any other way or any other facets of life so what do we expect really I was actually thinking about this the other day I think I'm quite lucky actually like in a weird way online like I'm very lucky I think I'm very I hate using this word privileged because it's just so overused but let's let's just let's just use it I've been trying to avoid using it all all night long but I'll this one time I'll use it I think online in a way I am quite privileged because I've noticed that I can definitely get away with a lot of my of vocalizing my opinions honestly and I can get away with it because even though I will make sort of some contentious videos, because I am black, uh, because I am from the so-called less developed third world, uh, because I've had a very abnormal childhood and um, therefore sort of, I guess sort of uh, socioeconomically, I'd be considered like working class in Britain even though sort of in terms of my education, in terms of sort of the culture that I consume, uh, the things that I sort of do, my concerns, my level of skills, uh, which are very minimal, I wouldn't be considered working class in that sense, but because of sort of just at face value. So in terms of sort of the, oh yes, also if we're going to label things, I'm, I'm I guess queer, I suppose um <laughs> I don't know um yeah yes uh let's just say I've done lots of things with women um and I'm very proud of it <laughs> so um it's it, in terms of all of those things just coming together I very much like tick a lot of boxes in terms of sort of the online I guess the 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 online uh, victim card or the um, sort of oppressed um, at a disadvantage all of that sort of rhetoric and stuff which I personally and I say this very personally because I know everybody's different but I also know that I have a very abnormal experience in terms of a black person for my from my experience online it hasn't actually been a disadvantage for me uh, if anything it's actually really enabled me to get away with a lot of things that I know if I were white I would not get away with at all um, so yes like I can be apolitical online and I can say that and people will have their opinions disagree with me like you know be upset about it whatever but it hasn't like really affected me in terms of what I'm trying to do with like my channel and growth and garnering an audience and that sort of thing. Like it hasn't affected me in the way that I feel if I was white, I would probably have to, I would have to really sit down with myself and think, right, if I'm going to do this online and try to make a living online, and garner an audience I actually I need to like sit down and I need to get my priorities in order I need to figure out right am I on the left I'm on the right um what is my sexuality um you know what are my thoughts about x y and z I'm very lucky I can be so fickle and so just <laughs> just very much um I'm in quite a good position at this point in time um, and I do mean at this point in time, who knows, it may change, what have you. But um, in terms of a lot of the things that I sort of hear on like sort of YouTube about sort of um, black creators being at a disadvantage, that sort of thing, I personally, for me, haven't noticed that. And that hasn't been something that I've 
experienced. Maybe I'm just oblivious. Uh, who knows? Uh, <laughs> or maybe I'm refusing to see what is there. Who knows? And quite frankly, I don't really care. Um, I enjoy this too much to like stop making content and to stop doing YouTube and stuff. So yeah, I think I've been also very lucky with my audience. I have a very receptive, engaging audience who I have ignored whilst going on this tangent. So um, I do apologize. Uh, let me interact with you again. I hope my one and only beloved uh, is still with us and hasn't been um, slaughtered by our, what's his name again? Uh, not the silent, the something admirer. Not the silent, I keep saying silent, my apologies. Joshua Craig says, <laughs> I'm honestly surprised you're not a Libra or Libra like me. I don't know what that, what is it? What is a Libra? I'm, should I look this up? Sorry, I'm very, very, oh yes, the shadow admirer. When are Libras born? Um, Libra dates. Oh, you're September to October child oh gosh okay I, I don't know what I meant to think about that <laughs> exactly I'm so sorry I'm not very in tune with uh horoscopes or with uh the whatever you call them I'm afraid um but so y you're coming up for a birthday Joshua we're going to have to celebrate um on this channel I think it is integral um I think we're going to have to have a, a birthday bash <laughs> somehow, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, don't know how yet, but we're going to have to, hopefully when I get my new software and I can actually stream things, that will, that will be, that will be a good, good, good one. Oh, thank you for the clarity. Off topic, cryptic kiwi, I do appreciate it. But um, yes, thank you very much. Laser Sphere's uh, profile picture is actually a rosy maple moth. Very interesting. Thank you, actually, because I love moths. Um, one of my favorite films is actually The Duke of Burgundy, um, which is actually a butterfly. But um, it, in terms of the featuring of moths in that, very well done. Uh, great film. We're talking a lot about uh, the more risque films uh, today. Uh, Nymphomaniac, um, The Duke of Burgundy, brilliant film, highly recommend, one of my all-time favourites, um, yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, Lilliput, oh brilliant, yes, Liz Truss, oh. You know what, I do think, Oh, Rihanna, I'm so sorry. I will, I will definitely be getting back to... Rihanna left a comment about the, the vegans. Yes, that is something. I've got like... <laughs> oh, gosh. This stream. I always babble for so long. I'm so sorry. I do apologise sincerely. The relic... Has the relic been... Yes, the relic is here. The relic is here. Yes, yes. Oh, I just haven't seen you as much, the relic. I do apologise. Usually the relic... Actually, I'm not blaming the relic for this, but usually I'm more in tune with identifying the relic in the chat and then I know exactly where I am. And when I need to change slides, I do apologize to everybody, including the relic for not being as savvy and as um, up to standard with regards to actually identifying the lag. I do apologize. But yes, I will be moving on to that right now, Rihanna. Beautiful name, love it. Love the spelling. I love that. That's the spelling of Rihanna that I actually like the most. Um, not that it's important, but just uh, yeah. Anyway, Lilliput says about trust <laughs> that um, trust is right. If we want British cheese, we have to chase it down a hill first. <laughs> Oh my gosh, yes. Liz, Liz is, um, I, I do think that Liz is going to win. Um, what that means, I do not know. Uh, I think it's probably in the Conservatives' best interest for Liz to become leader and thus by default Prime Minister. Democracy at its finest, folks. Um, but um, yes, yes, I'm quite certain 
we're not quite certain. I would predict that the Conservatives will lose a lot of seats if Sunak becomes leader as a consequence of... Um, firstly, I mean, the British are Conservative with a small c. So the idea of having um, a uh, non-white British leader of the Conservative Party, of all things. Uh, I don't know how that's going to feature with the main conservative demographic, which is the silent generation and uh, baby boomers. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to sit with them. Um, and also just the scandal about Sunak and his wife with her non-dom status and his entire upbringing. Um, is just so far beyond that of the average immigrant's upbringing and the average immigrant experience. I mean, his parents are both medical professionals. I think his mother's a high-end pharmacist, dad is a doctor, he went to private school all his life. Uh, he's a multimillionaire, he's married into a billionaire family. His wife's family has an empire in India. Um, and she doesn't pay any taxes in the UK. Um, their property ownership is just through the roof, both in the UK and internationally. I mean, he's definitely not a man of the people in, in any shape or form. Um, <laughs> so I think that also, especially in terms of the demographic whom the Conservatives really need to impress and maintain their votes from, which is the liberal, at least in the UK, the liberal leaning, although with a small conser small C conservative middle class who typically would vote Liberal Democrat or Labour prior to um, sort of Labour's turn with Corbyn. Um, yeah, yeah, I think they really need to attract that sort of, that demographic, who we can very crudely call the middle class, who are shrinking, and who do not have as much money as they used to, and are increasingly uh, being filled up with millennials, who are very disenchanted with politics, and very disenchanted with the political elite in the UK, and who don't own homes, or any have any stake or any uh, power financially in this country so it will be interesting and I don't think Sunak uh, being the first brown leader of the Conservative Party will be enough I think people are at least I find in the UK not in America as much but definitely in the UK um, People care, even though they may not admit it out loud, people care far more about sort of the, just the practicalities of living and their money and what they have in their life personally than they do about identity and the influence and the moralistic and ethical influence of identity on their lives and on the political landscape. Um, which is why a lot of people in the UK who vote conservative consistently will literally be like friends with the most bizarre looking individual with like, you know, bright pink hair, studs and piercings everywhere who like is ready for the Marxist feminist revolution. Um, you know, it's, it's very, <laughs> very interesting to sort of see. And, um, yeah, it's very different to in the US, where I think there's far greater polarization uh, in terms of groups and people. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think it'll be interesting. I'm very invested in just observing this whole thing playing out, because it's very interesting seeing sort of the conservatives trying to garner an ideology, which they don't need. Uh, but in terms of their in internal politics they do need that in order to you know uh, win the leadership election 
but sort of in the broader scheme of things, they don't need it as much because the left, just in the West in general, is so their identity crisis and juxtapositions are just so all over the place that you really don't have to stand for anything to really be a conservative, um, <laughs> as a conservative representative in houses um, of parliament, really and truly uh, beyond sort of your very typical everyday British things. Um, it's, you sort of just watch the fire <laughs> in the distance. <laughs> and aren't a part of it um but yeah yeah it's interesting to see them trying to take on ideology which they are terrible at so yes um good luck to both of them trying to um somehow make thatcherism common sense as they've both said it's been a soundbite for i think both of them primarily uh sunak recently about bringing common sense thatcherism to the people what that means he most definitely doesn't know and I can tell you I do not know what on earth that could possibly mean <laughs> um it's um oh I mean if he does become leader it'll be fascinating to see what that boils down to can't be good can't be good at all um Oh yes, the relic is giving me my, giving me my lag times. Um, I do apologise. I've missed so much. Thank you so much. Cool, cool watermelon. Love that. <laughs> and the profile picture of Shrek, I believe, <laughs> um, for your super chat. Very kind of you. Thank you so so much. I think people fake disorders due to sympathy. Yes, yes. I think that's definitely. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that that is definitely a component to it. I think um, I think a lot of attention, especially now, is also about trying to find, as Vagabond says, a sense of belonging. And also trying to find connections with people. And I think that is just so difficult nowadays, increasingly so, especially with the internet, as I always say. And... It is, it is, it is a sad thing. It is really, really sad, uh, especially because I think just society in general has failed. Modern society has failed in so many ways to such a great extent and in such a unknown, at least in the future extent, like the future just seems so ominous and so anxiety ridden for so many people. Uh, that sort of the different coping mechanisms that people have, particularly young people, who we need to remember, I know it's it's not like an excuse, but more so an explanation, just young people. I mean, I cannot imagine the damage I would have done if I had had a smartphone and TikTok <laughs> as a teenager or at the age of like 11, 12, even younger. The absolute damage I would have done on the internet is just I, I don't even want to imagine um I, I really don't so you know it's I think we need to sort of be a bit more understanding of that and also as Vagabond so effectively and succinctly put it trying to get that like sort of sense of belonging um which relates very much to what Cool Watermelon said. Uh, thank you so much for that super chat, by the way. Um, okay, I have spoken so, so much. <laughs> so, 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 so much. Uh, so I do, oh yes, my applause worked. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Rihanna, for that. Um, <laughs> that, oh, I'm so behind. That happened ages ago. Uh, yes, I'm going to be, oh, there, I just saw another super chat. So sorry. Thank you so much, Boat11111, for another super chat. Very much appreciated. So very kind of you. Um, you so smart. You got to let your US fans come through with the Snooga Booga Tuka. <laughs> um, 
thank you so much, Boat11111. One, 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 one. <laughs> Very much appreciate it. <laughs> yes, and as uh, Mariama said, uh, please give us what you're smoking. Honestly, please do. Um... <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for that. That was a good chuckle. Good chuckle to have. Thank you very, very much. Um, does anybody here actually smoke? <laughs> I'm very curious because I've always, I've sort of recently, well, I don't, I don't smoke. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not brave enough uh, to smoke, even though some, I watch a lot of, um, pipe smoking videos on YouTube, sort of about sort of the art of pipe smoking and individuals with their collections of pipes, uh, the different things which they smoke, tobacco, tea, very interesting. And sort of the entire, the rituals around pipe smoking is intriguing, fascinating. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not brave enough to go down that route. Um, a sort of recurring nightmare that I have is of myself smoking and sort of my body slowly just shriveling up like a raisin in the dream as a consequence of being a smoker and I think that freaks me out a bit too much that I don't actually venture into it in real life even though I find the image of it very enticing um but yeah yes I think when I when I when I sort of smell smoke and I hear somebody who's smoked for years coughing, I think, okay, maybe, maybe the image is the only enticing thing about it. But um, nonetheless, uh, I do find sort of people who smoke pipes, I find it a very, very interesting and very intriguing, very attractive thing. Um, and I also like Russian Sobranis. Um, I haven't smoked them. I just like the look of them. <laughs> And I do like watching YouTubers who review Russian Sobranis. Um, so yes, yeah. I think it was when I when I was quite young, I watched um, An Education. Brilliant film, by the way. Um, and yes, they were schoolgirls in Britain in the 60s smoking Russian Sobranis during their physical education class. Uh, and I thought that looked so cool. Um, so yes. <laughs> Biggie cheese. I I I I don't I'm nothing. I'm I call myself apolitical because it's just the easiest way for me to just be as fickle about my political leanings as I can because I honestly my opinions are just ever changing, ever influenced and are just so all over the show. And I really just don't care enough um you know, I sort of approach life very much like how I go to the gym now with regards to sort of uh, COVID. You know, I sort of, I go places, I make decisions and you know, what will be, will be. I just, you know, whatever fate <laughs> has in store for me, like whatever, uh, it's going to happen. And that is very much sort of how I just approach a lot of politics. I really... I think it's just my response to being so politically disempowered in this day and age. I really have no political power. I don't believe that my vote has ever had any influence. Um, I really don't believe that democracy is proving very effective. And I can definitely see why people are so disillusioned by it. I most definitely am in my context in the UK. And I can be disillusioned by it because bureaucracy in the UK is so strong and so powerful. Greatly more so than uh, the political process itself. And so, you know, it may be archaic, it may be uh, very abstract, it may be difficult to actually get around, it may be annoying and frustrating. But I think the way that bureaucracy has manifested itself in the UK means that people can be very disengaged in politics and things still at least have the appearance of working. Um, of course, there's many downsides to it, which most definitely there are. But I think sort of if I was in the US, 
I think there's a very different bureaucratic setup in the US in very, very crude terms. And then if you look at it just in terms of state bureaucracy, very different scenario depending on what state you live in. Um, and I think it would be very different in the US. If I was in the US, I think I'd be definitely, I would be very political. Um, and I think that just is contextual influences. So yeah, my context does not induce me and does not motivate me and does not incline me nor oblige me to align myself with any political party, with any ideology. Um, I'm in a very, in terms of just my very fickle nature, I'm in a very um, complementary physical situation. Um, and yes, who knows, that may change when I get older. <laughs> that may change as sort of I start to inevitably experience more things uh, as I get older. Inevitably, more ailments are going to inflict me. I'll have to very much emerge and be a part of sort of, I don't know, healthcare, uh, all those things. So yes. Um, but right now, I sort of, I'm constrained by bureaucracy. But I can very much distract myself from that constraint. Um, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I have not even gotten on to <laughs> the veganism thing, which I was quite interested in, like, talking about. Um, I may have to do that next week, considering the time. Wait, what's this screen? Oh yeah, that was one of one of my little vegan little things. One of my issues with veganism. Um, I don't know. Should I do that? Uh, let me just get rid of that because I know that that was very annoying. Oh yes, Bailey's comment once again. Hello, Bailey. Um, yes, let me just go through the chat quickly uh, and. I'm so sorry for missing so much of what people have been saying. I sincerely apologize. Um, I've, I've just been rambling so much today. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, oh, um, how far delayed am I? About 21 minutes behind on the chat. Um, very interesting comment. Do you mind if I talk about veganism next week? I'll change the thumbnail tomorrow. Because <laughs> I have a lot to say, but I am getting quite tired and I can feel my voice going and I have things to do in the morning. So I think if I go, considering how much I've spoken about certain things, which were only meant to take up like 30 minutes max, I doubt I'm going to be able to actually... condense my thoughts on veganism and the vegan agenda in relation to our future and in relation to humanity, especially with regards, in relation to, with regards to, insofar as the global food crisis at the moment, which I have been following quite intently, at least on news outlets, because it is very interesting and it's very interesting when looking with regards to veganism and also with regards to sort of green policies which sort of surround veganism and a more plant-based diet and sort of the very, uh, how do you say it? The particular vegan influence and also the companies who have basically monopolized the entire plant-based market, um, which I don't think gets us anywhere in terms of actually creating a more sustainable future. I think veganism has fallen into that trap of believing and being complicit in seeing human beings as consumers 
before seeing them as human beings. And I think veganism had an opportunity not to go down that route. And I think that there's so many spheres of life that should in no way permit people to be transformed into consumers. I think the most obvious example is um, the sexual marketplace. I think the transformation of individuals into modern consumers with regards to relationships and online dating is just the most detrimental thing that is that could ever happen, uh, at least in terms of forming relationships and connections and finding a prospective partner. I think it's really screwed so many people up. Um, and yeah, I think that's one domain which should be sacred. And I think another domain which should be sacred is in terms of sustainability and in terms of especially um, farming. Um, it seems that seems like a contradiction considering that it's all about uh, consumption, but in terms of just farmland ownership and also what is cultivated on what land. Um, I think veganism, especially because it's so online, just so much about like influences and celebrities and the lifestyle and dieting. Uh, it's very hard to get beyond that into sort of the other broader meanings and implications of sort of a vegan future and sort of this great appeal and just the money-making potential behind people being perceived as consumers and therefore it's all about the customer and all about making as much money from the consumer as is possible. And I think this is a domain which should be sacred. And, you know, I do not think that the market should infiltrate every facet of life. There are certain things where it really just should not be. Boundaries, always boundaries. Uh, boundaries are so important. Um, I guess that's also one thing that I respect about the shadow admirer. Maintaining anonymity has created a sort of boundary between us. So I think I don't feel violated <laughs> by their email. So um, yeah, I guess that's one positive I can look at with regards to um, <laughs> that, that particular um, one-sided interaction. Uh, but yes, yes. Um, <laughs> Joey Vaughan, don't worry, your 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 comment is uh is definitely going to be featured. Um, <laughs> oh no, Rihanna, you really you do not need to hate your name. You used to hate your name. Rihanna is a I I really like the name Rihanna. I went to in sixth form there was this girl called Rhiannon. I'd never heard of that name before. Loved that name. Thought it was a beautiful name. Um, yeah, I do. I like that name, Rihanna. I like um, names that start with R uh, and end with like an A. I like the name Rona, for instance. I really like the name Rona. Um, yeah, yes, yeah. Beautiful name. Rihanna Lynch. Ooh, my goodness. That's nice. That's nice. I like that. Rihanna Lynch. You know, just tell people that you're like David Lynch. Wait, actually, are you? Oh, now think about this carefully, Rihanna, because you are on the internet. And based on everything I've said tonight, if you fabricate, <laughs> if you fake uh, your identity, um, there's... I have been very understanding and I've been, I've tried to be sympathetic. So uh, if you choose to be related to David Lynch, um, the floor is all yours. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, um, definitely does sound like a David Lynch sort of relative. I could imagine like somebody related to David Lynch being called 
Rihanna. It's sort of, it has that David Lynch sort of aura to it. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you, <laughs> you have a crucial decision to make now, Rihanna. Um, <laughs> oh, very, very interesting. Okay. Oh, interesting. Sorry, now we're going off on a tangent, considering that I'm I'm going to say veganism for next week. But um, I'm going to go in five minutes, the relic. So yes, we've got another AD. My name is Adele. I hate having a singer's name. But you've got such an incredible singer's name. That's the difference. You see, if you had, I don't know. Ugh, I can't think of a terrible singer. I don't know. I, I really, I don't know. Again, my music is so fickle. I like everything in its own way. Um, I can't really think. I don't know. Six, nine. <laughs> <laughs> then, you know, maybe. But I, I, I think Adele, not only is Adele, I think it's a really beautiful name, Adele. It is very, it's it's very simple, but nonetheless very beautiful, uh, very elegant, very to the point. Um, it's sort of like a name that you, Adele. I don't know. It's got, it's got, it's got something. There's something about it for me. And then now, inevitably, it's got those connotations of being associated with Adele, and sort of for me at least, that's like very bold voice very much a you know it's sort of quite a mysterious person but also very sort of very down to earth but also sort of great sort of as you know the image of Adele you know you sort of hear Adele sing then you hear her talk and she's so like you know <laughs> you you she's sort of um you can imagine Adele sort of being at every single British woman's Hindu uh with a funnel and vodka <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's that's sort of what she reminds me of um but nonetheless she still has this like aura about her uh so yes I think I don't know I I can't feel sorry for you I think I've I can't feel sorry for you when I feel jealous of you uh let's put it that way um but I, I do understand. I, I do understand. Like, I'm sure when you introduce yourself as Adele, everyone's like, oh, I like the singer. And it's sort of like, you know, you're just bombarded with the, the image of the singer as opposed to, you know, wanting to, like, claim your name for yourself and who you are and your identity and everything. Um, that's what I try and, and failed, obviously, with uh, Rihanna Lynch uh, to, like, sort of not associate somebody's name with sort of somebody else who's famous and has that name, um, like Rihanna or David Lynch, but uh, miserably failed with that. <laughs> but um, yes, yes. Oh, right, let me just... Oh, goodbye, Alec, from a good half hour ago. Um, anyway, I do apologise. I've... <laughs> Really, I think I've missed a fight between my one and only true love and my gym partner. Um, Rihanna coming out with the great statements, uh, brilliant statements. I feel like I feel like I've missed a lot in the comments whilst I've just been going off about um, the Brit, uh, just everything. <laughs> so uh, I do apologize. Um, oh, some some very very g bold statements made. I like that one, Michael S. Is this Michael Scott? This definitely feels like a Michael Scott thing that would be said. Wisdom, but just so, just the weirdest wisdom ever. 
Michael Scott reminds me of Phil Dunphy. Um, I think they'd be great friends. <laughs> I would love to see a spin-off show of Modern Family and The Office where it's just Michael Scott competing with like, oh, Michael Scott and Phil Dunphy. But like, I don't know what the scenario would be. Um, oh, Michael Scott Paper Company wanting paper from, oh, supplying paper to Phil's magic shop. Oh, and then the battle ensues. The battle of the two great philosophers of our modern times. Um, just, oh, wow. <laughs> oh gosh, I used to have such a crush on Phil Dunphy. <laughs> oh gosh, okay. Um, oh. Oh, Kat said something interesting. Oh, we've got a lot of smokers here. Nice, nice, nice. I say that as if I'm one of the people, um, you know, one of the, like I'm a part of this the crew, um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yes. Um, Kat2123 says, honestly, I'm not goth. I just do my makeup for my page. I'm quite conservative looking. Oh. Oh, it's like in like your Instagram. Interesting, very interesting. You know, I was thinking this week, like I was thinking about sort of uh, different, because in my video, um, uh, the video that I'm putting out, uh, there's something about sort of subcultures. And like, I was thinking of sort of, um, just there's been quite a lot in the media about sort of how people look. And also with regards to like faking disorders, like sort of um, at least, what is presented in terms of the reaction videos, they all tend to look the same. Um, and there seems to be a lot of sort of judgment around how people decide to express themselves in appearance. And sort of why can't people just be normal, uh, whatever that means. And I was like sort of thinking in terms of sort of people who like aesthetically looking at them, I find very attractive, but for me personally, I would never sort of present myself in such a way. And like, I find people who have like excessive tattoos, especially like on their face and who have like lots of piercings, especially in abnormal places, like in their neck or on their chest. Um, I find it very, very attractive, like looking at sort of these people who sort of look like works of art. Like there's, um, there's a singer called, I think Jasmine, I forget. Sorry, I'm just looking at my phone to see. Uh, Jasmine, Jasmine Bean, a singer called Jasmine Bean. And they have also a few videos sort of on the, um, sort of same genre as Love Don't Judge videos. Just a video about how they dress and oh yes um anything for the look i think it's called or is that a quote that jasmine said um hooked on the look that's what it's called hooked on the look and um jasmine features with this other individual who just looks so intriguing so androgynous and just the most beautiful people like i just think like just the entire aesthetic is just absolutely, I find it very, like, just wow. And, um, but it's not something that I would ever for myself, like, you you know how I dress and how I look, you know, I'm the most <laughs> bland <laughs> dresser out there. Uh, very, very unexceptional. And it's nothing that I'd ever consider doing for myself, but I find it just absolutely, like, wow. And I also think, like, goth, like the very gothic um, sort of uh, image, especially on um, women, very, very like just intriguing to look at. So it was interesting just thinking, sort of seeing how, I think for some reason I've been watching a lot of sort of the uh, right-wing commentators recently 
and just their sort of obsession with sort of how people look and how people dress and why can't people just be normal and why do people want to stand out or whatnot and it's just um yeah yeah it just just made me think sort of of I guess sort of like personally how I'm very much very like sort of conservative looking I guess but then on the other hand on the other hand um when I look at people and what I sort of find attractive or like sort of compliment people on when they when I see them sort of out in public it's mainly people who are incredibly out there incredibly sort of just absolutely like just go absolutely wild on their body and their physical appearance um which I find the most interesting and most intriguing so yeah yeah it's um it's interesting uh sort of when we don't apply our standards to other people I guess or we don't there's sort of like a mismatch or a disjoint between I guess how we decide to present ourselves and then what we actually look at in the world and think wow uh so yeah but anyway enough of that tangent I thought I said I was going to be finishing in like um going to stop stop I've lost my train of thought so I was just reading comments about people smoking cigars oh my gosh yes the cough oh you know yeah yeah I think it's interesting I think I became intrigued by uh, uh like sort of cigar smoking uh mainly because of um I don't know why I'm doing like pipe but like cigar smoking like yeah um I mean Andrew Tate is like obviously that's like sort of his signature thing but it was mainly Sigmund Freud uh, I thought Sigmund Freud looks so cool with his cigar um but imagine if we'd looked inside his mouth oh and his throat wow gosh yeah I mean like to be fair I'm very much one of those people who's who are like you know um I don't really sort of judge people on sort of the health factors of like smoking. I think, you know, the tobacco industry is like as corrupt <laughs> as any other industry. Um, and I think, um, you know, I, I, I could literally cross the road right now and be knocked over and killed. Um, and there's like people like sitting, like smoking <laughs> cigarettes, um, like living their life uh so so you know i don't really get that argument personally but so you know each to their own i guess and i think since coming to the uk i've sort of realized you know it, at least in this part of europe young people are going to smoke i mean kids smoke or at least now they're vaping more so um a lot less kids are smoking they're very much just vaping all the time and you know it's it, it's gonna happen so yeah yeah I'm, I'm not terribly judgmental on like sort of smoking and all of that um terribly but um it's interesting it's very interesting it's a very interesting sort of culture around smoking um and yeah 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 it, it, it's interesting to sort of see uh especially at when i worked in retail sort of all the smokers um there were sort of this unspoken uh, un, unspoken unspoken <laughs> ritual around smoking you sort of you know it was sort of like they would gravitate toward each other or toward going on a break at a certain time so that they could smoke uh it was it was interesting to like see that um and also just sort of how a lot of them wanted to quit but couldn't sort of you could tell when somebody was stressed by um you know how much they smoked I sort of like seeing how people smoke, the different ways that they smoke. It's very interesting to, to see. Uh, I very much like people's sort of dispositions and sort of their hand movements, um, their sort of dexterity. And I think smoking like cigars or cigarettes or pipes is very much sort of like a lot of also like hand movement and sort of how you use your like hands to like light up a cigarette and all of that. And so it's, it's, it's interesting. I find it very attractive to look at. So, um, yes. Um... I have just 
lost the plot today. I do apologize. Um, <laughs> oh gosh. Oh, thank you so much, Joy. That, that was sweet. <laughs> We'd probably get like about, I don't know. I'm not sure. Oh, I don't, I don't know. If, if you were my campaign manager, we might do well. I think if I was at it alone, um, likelihood of getting like a thousand votes, uh, that would probably be the extent of it for us, I think. But, um, you know, who knows? <laughs> if I ever do decide to go into politics, um, yeah, yeah, um, you're, you're definitely in the running as campaign manager, Joe. Uh, <laughs> And obviously, Joshua and I will be like a power couple. Um, you know, the the I think I think we're we're in need of a good power couple in politics. We haven't had one in a very long long time. I think in the U.S. Oh, power couples, power couples. I'd say the Obamas were the closest to sort of a twenty first century power couple. I don't think anything really compares to the Kennedys, or at least the, actually, mm, actually, no, no, I lie, I, I'm forgetting about uh, the Clintons, but there was just so, oh gosh, that was, that was a power couple, but that was also, that was just, wow, that was like, uv light power um <laughs> and not necessarily in a good way but it's it's uh yeah interesting very interesting i think like the 20th century the late 20th century had the best power couples in politics in the u in u.s politics um definitely the most i think it was sort of a very interesting time where there was sort of more personality politics but also not the toxic influence of the internet and social media um so yes yeah i think yeah that that was that was an era uh the kennedys and clintons i'd say oh also reagan oh nancy reagan ah oh, wow that that was very uh shakespearean macbeth <laughs> Wow, that was a weird, that was, I talk as if I was there, I was not there, I'm just going by what I've like read and watched and that was, that was the time, um, but yeah, yeah, sort of, yeah, power couples, something, uh, we haven't really had that um, in the 21st century in American politics, in British politics, never really had that. I think the most like sort of memorable for me is at least Thatcher and Dennis Thatcher, mainly because Dennis was like so overpowered by Thatcher, but he was sort of like, you know, there as well. Um, I was sort of hoping we were going to have sort of a power couple with Theresa May and her husband, but he was just far too just, I think she was running through the fields of wheat a bit too fast for him to keep up. Um, yeah, yeah, and she was sort of a one-woman show. So, <laughs> and Boris and Carrie is her name. Carrie's just, um, oh dear. Um, but yeah, I think Boris has had far too many women and far too many kids for us to actually see any value in any relationship that he has in his personal life because we can just assume that it's not going to last very long. Uh, but who knows, maybe I wish him all the best, I guess, with um, his current situation, I guess. Um, oh yeah, they are actually married. But I guess in Boris's mind, it's probably just a situation that he finds himself in um, until the next young blonde thing comes around. Um, who knows? I'm so pessimistic about Boris. <laughs> My apologies to any Boris supporters out there. Um, yeah. Joshua, I actually haven't asked if you're actually from the US. I assume you are. Uh, I just assume. Uh, but yes, um, you can definitely be my American boy. Don't, don't you worry. You are definitely my American boy. <laughs> oh, goodness me. 
I think I am so I've I've honestly I've I'm sure I've missed so much so much chat Rebecca Ed says I'm vegan and love nuts <laughs> in response to the relic of vegans nuts um Rebecca love your profile picture by the way beautiful love black and white photography um what nuts are you speaking of um I like I like I like all nuts um I, I'm I'm a simple gal uh <laughs> oh gosh nuts are great um all nuts but for the sake of wanting to remain monetized uh let's talk about um I was going to say, let's talk about the nuts that you swallow, uh, but that doesn't really clarify things. But let's talk about, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it's, um, in terms of, uh, I was going to say, in terms of nuts that grow, no, in terms of, um, like nuts that you buy in a supermarket, um, I'd say my favorite at the moment are macadamia nuts. I love them. Oh, they just, you just, the fat in macadamia nuts is the kind of fat that I love. It tastes so good. It's good fat. Oh, love macadamia nuts. Absolutely love them. Um, but yes. Oh, yes. I'm going to keep this comment about, uh, star that comment. Thank you, Beatrix. Um, I will remember that for when I actually speak more thoroughly about veganism. I'm sorry, I'm just so behind on the chat and I said I was gonna go in five minutes and I don't know how long ago that was. Um, <laughs> according to the relic uh, from 21 minutes ago, timer one, two minutes, 30 seconds. Let's, let's, let's catch up. I'm so sorry, I've missed so much of the chat. <laughs> I actually like eye tattoos, Rihanna. I really like eye tattoos. It looks so painful, but I think that they are just, again, intriguing. Um, and of course, I don't understand why people would inflict that kind of pain on them. But it's also something that I sort of admire. Sort of, you know, people actually being so invested in the aesthetic that they want to cultivate in and of themselves that they are actually willing to really do such a thing um you know i don't want to sort of be sanctimonious about such things like i very much value my sight um and it's very you know it's, it's very important to me um but in terms of other people deciding to take that risk I mean, wow. Um, but yes, I, I agree with uh, Michael Scott. I do not think that such tattoos are going to age well. Um, and I think that is a, a big problem also with a lot of um, cosmetic procedures. Um, there's, I think because they're just such a new phenomena and such a modern thing, there isn't that appreciation, I don't think, with a lot of people that they are going to inevitably age and that the vast majority of them are not going to be able to age in such a way that they can afford to actually disguise the aging process in the way that they want I think and even people who have actually uh quite I'd say successfully disguised their age behind cosmetic procedures this is purely my opinion I know that I'm probably in the minority on this but I think that Joan Rivers uh in terms of her cosmetic procedures with regards to her age um yeah, I think 
she <laughs> somebody's now going to get out the most savage picture of Joan Rivers out there but actually let me do that um just before I go Joan Rivers oh may she rest in peace queen um in terms of her um sorry let me just uh Joan um sorry bear with me um I think that Joan is just wait oh wait no it's not working sorry one second bear with me I will, I will get this one day this is all going to work so well for me I kid you not uh oh wait I think it has it's nearly there but I think that Joan has actually there she is my queen um, <laughs> I think like I would I would I would I would I'm baffled in for instance I was always baffled by her age um really baffled but I think she did uh, a, a good job if that is what you are inclined to do uh personally plastic surgery is not for me I'm very much about natural aging um yeah yeah that's that's just me but I know that a lot of people aren't and you know it is what it is so Oh, goodbye, Rihanna. It was lovely to have you here. Absolutely fantastic contributions. Thank you so much. Um, oh my gosh, Sahara, that's a brilliant point about smoking. Thank you. I'm just putting that on the screen. Oh, brilliant. That, that brilliant. But um, yes, about Joan Rivers again. Um, I think that she, for instance, could look like this because she had the money to look like this and to ensure that she looked like this. Um, I cannot not imagine how it felt uh, within her face. It must have been agony. Uh, but yeah, that was what she wanted and that is what she got. And I think a lot of these people now are not going to be able to, I guess, keep up with the procedures in order to ensure that they look um like what I believe Joan looks like um I guess um so it's it's tricky it, it's very tricky because I don't think I think we need to accept our mortality as Sahara so beautifully put it with regard to smoking and I quote what I find attractive about smokers is that, is that there's an inherent coming to terms with their mortality yes I do agree with that, very much so. Um, but um, yes, yes, I do agree with agree with that. Very, very interesting. Very good point. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Joan Rivers, everybody. <laughs> um, I, I can't hear the applause. I'm assuming that there is an applause. <laughs> Oh my gosh, boat one 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 with those those stunning compliments, Kitty. Your lips look like Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> I do like their donut holes; they're delicious. Um, thank you so much. Oh gosh, this flirting is just um, preventing me from actually finishing my um, <laughs> finishing my stream. Um, Nancy Reagan had Twitter. Really? Wait, was Twitter around when Nancy was around? Did she even know what Twitter was? Ooh, I'm not, I don't know about that. Anyway, so I'm just seeing so many miscellaneous brilliant comments. Uh, 
Joshua is as American as it gets. Um, do you like your country music? Do you wear, do you, have you been on a ranch? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, yes. Uh, are you like your stereotypical American? Do you hunt for your dinner? Um, <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Oh, do you listen to country music? Yes, I think that, 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 um, I think you do. You said, yes, you have told me, yes. Joshua does listen to um, Johnny Cash. Uh, so yes, yes. Uh, this is actually another topic. Vague Anne says, like that name, brilliant name, that Vague Anne has uh, said, I'm actually going, I have to go soon because it's nearly been like four hours at this point. I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> I just keep talking. Um, Right, I'm going to go in the next, Joan is still with us, I'm going to go in the uh, next five minutes, so the relic, I'm, I'm watching you, I'm watching you thoroughly right now, but this is something else that I want to talk about, because I feel that there is, even if it's not a conscious philosophy, there's a subconscious philosophy around these particular men in powerful positions, um, notably, I'm so sorry, Emmeline, if you're still here or if you watch this, Elon Musk, and also around Bojo, Boris Johnson, of spreading their seed and somehow it doesn't seem to, at least in the image of the public, tarnish their image in the way that you would expect, um, that you would expect it would. And it's interesting because uh, there, what's his name? Michael Hancock, I think his name is, uh, who had to resign from his government post after he'd had an affair in the House of Parliament. Uh, great footage on that, if you're <laughs> curious. He was caught on camera uh, cheating on his wife with a woman who is married to Oliver Bonas. Uh, I think that's what it's called. It's a whole designer. He's an interior designer, has shops all over the UK, very high-end stuff, quite expensive. Um, I'm surprised Boris and Carrie didn't get there uh, number 10 Downing Street, uh, refurnished by Oliver. Um, but yeah, I guess <laughs> maybe too close to home, but, um, it, it, it's interesting seeing sort of how these particular men sort of distribute their seed among the population. And, uh, it's, it, 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 it seems to work in their favor in many a way, maybe not in a conscious way, maybe more so indirectly than directly, but there is definitely something to it and something quite interesting in this idea of sort of procreating in this way um, and being proud of it as well. And um, it's interesting. I would actually, like if anybody in the comments is like sort of inclined toward this way of life or this philosophy, I'd be very interested to hear because I do find it very interesting, especially in the modern context where it is such an anomaly, at least insofar as it is publicized. Um, it's, if it is happening, it's very much like a secret or an open secret more than anything else. But it would be so interesting to just um, hear about it and hear what people think about that. Maybe I'll do that next week as well, alongside with um, talking about veganism more thoroughly, because I'd be very interested to hear from our fellow vegans about their lifestyle and also about why they became vegan or... Um, what they think about the vegan, the most prominent voices in the online vegan spaces, like our vegan, that vegan teacher and her quote unquote daughter, um, 
I think her name is Tasha Peterson or Pearson, I think Peterson rather in Australia and her vegan activism. And um, yeah, yeah, so that will be for next week. Um, I do apologize sincerely for being so terrible with keeping up with the chat this week. I really have just been babbling more than usual, I think. Um, uh, it's uh, so yes, yes, yes. I do apologize. <laughs> Thank you, Sahara. Sahara <laughs> Yes, I do feel like an old soul, but then I do, I, I do have a lot of my moments. Um, <laughs> I, I like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> oh goodness! But um, yes. Uh... <laughs> oh my goodness. And there's another one as well. Another one. I actually, um, I'll be perfectly honest with you, Boat. Uh, I'm just going to call you Boat at this point because I keep forgetting whether there's five or three ones. And then I sort of look, but there's sort of an optical illusion in sort of all the ones being together. So I do apologize. But um, I actually haven't farted during this stream. Um, I haven't. I think, I think I've been talking so much. I mean, who knows? Maybe I have farted, I just have not realized it. But I haven't farted during this stream. Um, have I farted on other streams? Not knowingly. I think my stomach grumbles a lot on my streams because I don't eat. Um, but I did eat before this stream, so I've been okay. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't recall uh, farting. I am very fortunate in that all of my farts are very silent um, and at least in my opinion, they don't smell. I don't smell them. And at least when I fart in public, nobody else smells them or seems to make any reference to being able to smell my farts in public. So um, I think I'm quite fortunate in that sense, except one downside. Um, I have gotten into very recently getting full body waxes. So now um, I have noticed that because there is absolutely no hair down there um if i'm like sitting and my legs are very tightly together or i cross my leg i've crossed my legs and i let out a silent toot um potentially there is the potential for very subtle acoustics um but nothing so noticeable that i wouldn't like fart in public as a consequence. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, um, I have noticed that. So that's one downside of getting the, the full sweep. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> yes, yes, uh, so that, that was noticeable. But it has been absolutely lovely. <laughs> oh, Yusuf, I do like your uh, <laughs> song quotes. Um, but, um, it has been lovely talking to all of you and seeing all of you. It was lovely seeing some familiar faces whom I haven't seen in a while. Uh, Daria, Veronica from last week. I hope that you are feeling better or at least recovering. Noah Brown wasn't here today. I miss Noah Brown. Uh, our, our signature Gen Xer. Um, but it has been absolutely lovely seeing everybody and seeing some new faces and some new people commenting down in the comment section. Tioga, absolutely wonderful seeing you. And also, but Rihanna, Rihanna's gone now, but it was lovely seeing Rihanna. Adele, um, everybody, Costco Road Drift, The Relic, I guess, in some way. Of course, my one and only. Um, <laughs> yes. Sentimental. I love that name. <laughs> yes. I read American and thought Texan. <laughs> oh my gosh. Texas is just... I don't know. There's something about Texas. I think it's the myth, the myth around Texas for the rest of the world that is just intriguing and so difficult to grapple. Like, I just literally think that they are just oil barons and, like old ranch families just congregating in Texas and that everybody's just singing country and 
yeah, I think I, I just... <laughs> I'm not against it at all. Um, I say that in a very positive way. Uh, well, maybe not like sort of the oil barons, but in, 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 in terms of my, my very mythical image of what Texas is and what a Texan is, um, I know it's very much like a, just a, a myth. Uh, it's absolutely nothing to do with what Texas actually is. I mean, Texas really isn't, <laughs> isn't that, I'm quite sure. But um, yes, um, I think I blame the Golden Girls, especially Blanche Devereaux. Uh, Blanche Devereaux. The Golden, the Golden Girls definitely played on that Southern stereotype um, and Southern stereotypes. Um, in a way, of course, it was like entertainment and funny, but I do blame the Golden Girls because I get a lot of my cultural references for what the South was in the 80s and therefore, as a consequence, obviously, in my mind, is now from the Golden Girls. So, if anything, you can't blame me. You need to blame the Golden Girls, okay? Especially Susan Harris, who wrote the Golden Girls. You can see I watch way too much Golden Girls. I know exactly who wrote it. Um, <laughs> and the opening credits. But it is time for me to go. Thank you all for being a friend. Uh... <laughs> I'm so so sorry about um just lagging behind I am going now uh it has been absolutely wonderful talking to you I will be seeing you this week um on Tuesday with my long video that I've done and also if you are on Patreon I'll see you on Friday with my one or two or three videos uh, of kids clips or otherwise I will see you again on Sunday live at the usual time at nine o'clock or 9.05. Uh, I need to really speed up my clock. I think it's gotten behind. I do analog so forgive me. Um, but yes, I'll see you then and Yes. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the stimulating conversation and for just listening to me babble on and on and on. Uh, it's great just talking, not into the void, but to actual people who are willing to give me the time of day. And yes, um, thank you so much, as always, to our fantastic moderators, the absolute creme de la creme of this live stream. Sahara, absolute best, and Cat2123, absolutely phenomenal individuals. Thank you so, so much for your hard work and for just being here, especially, I know you have such busy lives and I so appreciate you being here. Um, please don't feel obliged to be here for the whole stream ever at all. Uh, seriously, do not. I'm just so thankful for the psychological well-being that you give me. So thank you so much. Goodbye to all of you. Salutations as a goodbye this time. Sounds so weird. I uh, saying that as a goodbye, but yes. Thank you so much. Goodbye, Vagabond. Goodbye, the relic. Oh my gosh. I know I failed today, didn't I? Yes, Minecraft stream coming soon, as soon as I get the software. So yes, thank you so much to our moderators. Thank you so, so much. And yes, I will see you very, very soon during this week. And also again for another live where we'll talk about veganism and we'll also talk about um the particular way of procreating um according to bojo and elon so yes thank you so much for being here everybody <laughs> thank you <laughs> goodbye <laughs> bye 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 everyone <laughs> goodbye oh joshua my love goodbye stay safe we have we have somebody stalking us you particularly um goodbye <laughs>